Wednesday, November 4th, 2020 meeting of the Ann Arbor Planning Commission. This meeting is being held electronically to protect public health and safety due to the COVID-19 virus and to comply with orders issued by the governor, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and or the Washtenaw County Health Department. We intend to conduct this meeting similarly to an in-person meeting. However, please be patient if there are technical issues. Public comment will be held via telephone only. To speak during any of the public comment opportunities, please call 877-853-5247 or another of the published numbers and enter meeting ID 986-8779-4536. This information is also available on the published, webs uh, the published agenda in the public notices section of the city website and on the broadcast of this meeting on CTN channel 16, AT&T channel 99, and online at a2gov.org slash watch CTN, and then you select the government channel. Mr. Leonard, can we have a roll call, please? Yep. Commissioner Briggs? Here. Commissioner Mills? Here. Commissioner Milstein? Here. Commissioner Gibrandle? Here. Commissioner Ackerman? Here. Commissioner Sove? Here. Commissioner Abrams? Here. Commissioner Hammerschmidt? Here. We have a quorum. Very good. The next item on the agenda is introductions. And I do have a resolution of appreciation for um, Wendy Woods. There's a caller on the line. Um, Mrs. Woods, if that is you, could you please press star nine and we will let you in. We weren't sure if she would be able to join us tonight. Okay, so I will read the appreciation for her. Um, whereas Wendy Woods has served on the Ann Arbor City Planning Commission for 12 years from 20, 2008 to 2020. And whereas Wendy Woods also provided leadership as chair of the Ann Arbor City Planning Commission during that time. And whereas Wendy Woods has provided valuable insight based on her experience and over 30 years of service to the city of Ann Arbor, serving on the Transportation Commission, the Energy Commission, the Parks Advisory Commission, the Environmental Commission, and the Solid Waste Commission, and as a University of Michigan Associate Director of the Michigan Community Scholars Program and adjunct lecturer. And whereas Wendy Woods has used her wisdom and knowledge of the community to discern appropriate actions of the commission while providing leadership in the pursuit of community goods, community goals. And whereas Wendy Woods has contributed significant time and energy to improve the quality of development proposals and support regional planning and collaboration efforts. And whereas Wendy Woods has ensured through vigorous and thorough examination that all voices in the process are heard. And whereas Wendy Woods collegiality, civility, foresight and commitment will be missed by the commission. Be it therefore resolved that the Ann Arbor City Planning Commission expresses its sincere gratitude and commends Wendy Woods for her dedicated service to planning in the city of Ann Arbor on this fourth day of November, 2020. And then the, uh, this resolution is signed by all of us. I was wondering if I could have a commissioner move this, moved by Commissioner Milstein. Everybody wants to second it. Uh, I, you can put Commissioner Hammerschmidt as the official second. Um, is there any discussion on the motion? Commissioner Gibrandel. The only thing I would like to add is that I also really appreciated um, um, Commissioner Wood's ability to think about the campus and its intersection with our planning process. Um, and so I'm not going to change the motion, but it's just something that occurred to me after the after the fact. So if she's watching or anything, I'm not sure when when we get to gush about Wendy. <laughs> um, but that that that's something that I really appreciated that she always had that perspective, and um, they're a big part of our community. And I really appreciated that about her. In addition to all the other fabulous things that we're just doing. I think now is the appropriate time to gush. Okay. Commissioner Milstein. So I'll go on slightly funnier. Um, 
tone here. Um, so it's actually, it was, it's really interesting to realize that Wendy was with us or on the planning commission for 12 years. Uh, never once did she mention that, that she's been on for 12 years. We've had previous commissioners over the years who would tell us all about how long they've been with uh, on the planning commission, but she never mentioned it. Um, so at, that just shows that she, she never wanted to one up anybody. And um, she, you know, I've, she was on here the entire time I've been on here for however many years it's been now. Um, and she brought a, a great perspective, um, asked great questions, and was super respectful to anybody who called in and to all of us. So for that, uh, Wendy, if you're watching this, thank you so much for your leadership and for being a part of this commission. Um, I am um, sad to see you go. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of change, but this is one of those other changes that I'm sad about. Uh, but I hope that you are enjoying your Tuesday evenings now uh, and uh, enjoying that time off uh, with your family. And that does it for me. Anything else to add? Similar to Alex, I'll just add that the list of commissions that she was involved in, like I knew about the one or two that she served at, at you know, at the time because she would give updates, but it's amazing the amount of expertise that she added to the city in so many different capacities. Um, and there are many times where I, you know, when I have the floor, I'm trying to channel like what would Commissioner Woods do? And we can't see the students who are joining us now, which is one of the sad parts about um, about operating the, our, you know, meetings via Zoom. Often we would have, for community members who might not know, have students come and observe our meetings as part of their class. Um, and Commissioner Woods would always be the first to like call out and ask where they're from and um, encourage them to come up during public comment and speak. And I think, um, she was a great a uh, great role model. So again, Commissioner Woods, if you're listening, happy Tuesdays and Wednesdays in this odd case. Um, but your uh, all you've taught us is remains with us. So Commissioner Ackerman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just just briefly, um, serving alongside Commissioner Woods was a was a pleasure, as other people have have mentioned. Um, but I just I really admire the time and intention she spent listening um, and asking questions to get to the truth and to form her perspective. And then her ability to, from that position of understanding, challenge gently but firmly. And there was no one who was sacred in the process. It could be staff, it could be the petitioner, it could be our neighbors and residents. Um, but when she, when, when the understanding that she gained and earned um, through her questions and through her listening came in conflict with, you know, assertions that other people made based on, you know, assumptions. She, she never hesitated to, to correct, which I really admire. All right. Seeing no other hands, um, I say we vote on this. All those in favor of the resolution of appreciation, please raise your hand or say yes. 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 Any opposed? Clearly none. Um, the motion carries. Um, any other introductions, Mr. Leonard? And uh, Commissioner Briggs and Commissioner Ackerman, if this is your last public meeting, um, we would encourage you to, we will encourage you to come back when we sing your praises as well. We will call upon you for one more Tuesday night. Um, when it's actually a Tuesday and not a Wednesday. <laughs> um, next up is approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion to um, move the agenda? Moved by Commissioner Milstein, seconded by Commissioner Hammerschmidt. Any discussion of the agenda? I have one, and that is we have two items tonight. I would wonder if the commission would be interested in adjusting it for the benefit of the petitioners to talk about the petition first and then the work plan discussion after that. All right. Um, so um, do, is it friendly to Commissioner Milstein and Hammerschmidt to amend that? 
Um, any other adjustments to the agenda? Okay, all in favor of the agenda as amended just now, please say yes or raise your hand. Yes. 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 Any opposed? I don't see any, so the motion carries. We will move forward with an amended agenda. Um, the item five is the minutes of the previous meeting. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes of the October 20th, 2020 meeting? Moved by Commissioner Abrams, seconded by Commissioner Sauvey. Any discussion of the minutes? All in favor of the mission minutes as drafted, please raise your hand or say yes. 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 That is everyone. The motion carries. Item number six is reports from City Administration Planning Council or City Council, sorry, not Planning Council, City Council, Planning Manager, Planning Commission, Officers and Committees, and written communications. There were some written communications in the packet that we received. Um, uh, but first we will turn to Council Member Ackerman. Do you have any report for us? I do not have a report for you. City Council will meet tomorrow evening uh, we will, because of this week being uh, the week of election day. Um, glad to see since in the time since I checked in on the election last, Michigan has been declared for Joe Biden. So that's exciting news. And all of our eyes are tuned to Philadelphia and Las Vegas, I'm sure. Um, but uh, I, so in, in lieu of a report, I just want to take a moment to, to thank each of you. Uh, this will be my last planning commission meeting as, as a member of the board. Um, so I want to thank each of you for your service to Ann Arbor. Um, as planning commissioners and planning staff members, uh, you all are called upon to work long hours, give painstaking care to minute detail, speak hard truths to neighbors, and sometimes make unpopular decisions. You listen, you learn, you deliberate thoughtfully on hundreds of issues, some bland and dull, uh, but each important. And you do all this for no reward other than service to others and commitment to our collective future. Uh, I also wanna thank you for the greatest learning experience that I could have asked for. Through your collective insight and experience over these past four years, I've come to truly understand how important land is. Land is everything for our future. It's how we leverage this limited resource that will dictate our economy, our environment, our culture, our equity, and our very sense of community. And this is perhaps the most revolutionary lesson that I've learned in my time at City Hall. Uh, you're the sharpest board staffed by some of the best professionals with whom I've had the pleasure to serve with. Uh, and each of you is, is an A player. So I wish all of you the very best in your future considerations. And I trust you will make us all proud. Oh, goodness. Thanks, Commissioner Ackerman. <laughs> You're going to be missed. I mean, you're, you have big shoes to fill. Um, yeah, I will sing praises later. Or do you want to sing praises now? What's appropriate? All right, we'll come back. All right, um, Mr. Leonard, do you have any update? Uh, it's awfully hard to follow, um, uh, but um, uh, Commissioner Ackerman. Uh, for my part, thank you and thank you for your role. I've always really valued uh, your role both on the Planning Commission and City Council. I think you've been a, a great ambassador of the dialogue at the Planning Commission table to the City Council, um, um, which I know at times is is um, difficult um, and um, sometimes communicating um, uh, tension-filled um, deliberation and decisions, but um, I, I always uh, valued how thoughtfully you did that. So thank you. Um, uh, just one update. We have a working session scheduled for next week. Um, we have a, a, a pre-PUD petition application for your consideration for 530 North Division. Um, in short, it's a proposed um, PUD to allow um, a development prototype to um, increase density and allow um, it to be conducted in a, in a very high sustainable fashion. So um, um, that is the sole item on that agenda. It's possible I might also um, add a touch point on um, some of the ORC's dialogue of the proposed site plan review thresholds process as well. 
and that's all I have. Excellent. Are there any other commissioner officers or committee liaisons that have anything to report? Mr. Leonard just touched on the thing that we we talked about at ORC last week, um, which is the the charge that we had from council to look at the site plan process for small projects. Um, and so he kind of gave us an update um, on that. We reviewed kind of more tables, making very clear how many things are um, included in, you know, are required with a site plan. Um, so uh, I expect that you will all be wowed when you see this. Um, there's a lot of work behind there and it, it makes it clear like the high standard that we have for a lot of projects. Um, okay, uh, and I already said that we had some written communications that I'm sure you all were able to check out as well. So we're on to item number seven. And oh, just, oh, sorry, uh, Shannon. Sorry, Commissioner Gibrandel. Can I just can I just jump in for a second? So um, I need to recuse myself for next week. And I know a lot of people are leaving too. Do we need any kind of quorum for a working session or no? Uh, not for a working session. The working session, we will not be advancing any actions on a petition. Okay. Great. Um, so now we'll move on to item number seven, which is audience participation. This is an opportunity for persons to speak up for up to three minutes about an issue that's not listed as a public hearing on this agenda, which is 2115 South Straight Street Marijuana Provisioning Center or Retailer, um, or our work plan, because I think we will um, allow for a public hearing on that too, if you wanna speak specifically to that item when we talk about it. Um, to comment on any other matter, please call 877 853-5247 and enter meeting ID 986-8779-4536. Mr. Leonard will select callers that have digitally raised their hand. Um, you digitally raise your hand by pressing star nine and he'll call on you by the last three digits of your telephone number. Um, when you hear, you'll hear an automated announcement that you have been unmuted and are able to speak you may need to unmute your phone it yourself. Um, and please move to a quiet area and turn off any television or background sounds so that we can hear you clearly. Um, and please do state your name and address for the record. So I do see a couple callers that are on the line now. If you want to speak at this audience participation opportunity, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. All right. I haven't given Sandy a look to make sure that the call in numbers, but since we have two, I think we're probably safe that things are um, advertised correctly. So we'll close the audience participation. Um, and there's another opportunity for this at the end of the meeting as well. Um, item number eight is the public hearings for the next business meeting. Yes, we have three uh, new uh, public hearing items for the November 17th meeting. Um, uh, one is 2111 Packard Street, rezoning and site plan for city council approval. This is the proposal to remove an existing retail building and construct a new three-story, 79,000 square foot multifamily building with that includes 3,600, approximately 3,600 square feet of retail, of ground floor retail space. The project proposes 72 dwelling units, um, with a total of 119 bedrooms and 84 surface parking spaces. Um, second uh, new item is 2060 West Stadium Boulevard, site plan for city council approval and special exception use for planning commission approval. Um, this is a proposal for a four story, 120,000 square foot self storage building, uh, a three story, 23,000 square foot mixed use building, and uh, uh, the mixed use building, including a ground floor bank, um, two upper floors of office and a proposed drive through, thus the special exception use um, request to the planning commission approval. Uh, the petitioner is also proposing to rezone a portion of the site, which is currently zone P parking to C2B business service zoning classification. 
Um, the, uh, the petitioner is also seeking a variance separately to reduce the parking being proposed for the site. And then finally, near north townhomes rezoning and site plan for city council approval with plan project modifications. This is 700 North Main, a petition to rezone a 1.2 acre site from PUD to R4C and a site plan for 22 townhomes, um, including a request to modify the front setback from 25 to 10 feet and the rear setback from 33 to 22 feet. Uh, this development will include the removal of five landmark trees. Um, mitigation is of course proposed and some uh, modification to the floodplain with mitigation is proposed. Um, this last project is a former um, a 39 unit affordable housing that was previously approved on North Main and this is a um, re conceptualing uh, reconception of redevelopment of that site. Very good. Thank you very much. So um, we're now taking up item 10A because we did the swap on the agenda earlier. So this is the new business, which is 2115 South State Street Special Exception Use Request for City Planning Commission Approval. It's a request for an accessory marijuana provisioning center retailer incidental to a marijuana grower at 2115 South State street which is zoned m1a the grower and its accessory provisioning center will occupy a total of 2,000 square feet of the existing building on 1.65 acres and so um, for the public or for the petition will first have the petitioner give a presentation for up to 10 minutes um, and then staff can fill in uh, what else they we ought to be calling our attention to and then we'll open the public hearing um before i get started is there anybody missing from the petitioner team that has not been promoted that you were expecting um there were two callers um that should have that should be added do you want the last four of their phone numbers or do you want their names or um give me their names first uh, Jason Bricko and Ray Kalasho. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hi. Okay. Um, all right. Um, uh, if you're um, ready, I think Alexis, you have a presentation for them. If you want to go ahead and um, bring that up, and uh, we'll start uh, ten minutes. Great. Um, well, first and foremost, thank you all for considering this petition. Uh, my name is Brian Fennec. I'm on behalf of uh, the petitioner. Um, Jason Bricko and Ray Kalesho's agent. Um, joined with, um, joining me tonight is Kyle Gonzalez with Damian Farrell Design Group. Um, and uh, this has been a, 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 a long journey to get here. And um, we are, again, grateful for the opportunity to uh, have it heard finally. And we're grateful for staff um, for all their help over the last few years. Um, to get us here. So um, without further ado, I'll hand it off to Kyle and he can walk you through um, the plans for the accessory provisioning center um, that will accompany a cultivation facility. Thanks, Brian. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Um, the property is 2115 South State Street. It's located in between Stadium and Eisenhower. Uh, it's surrounded on uh, north and south by Ann Arbor Township and then to the west uh, office district and then to the east. Um, it's public land separated by railroad tracks there. Uh, Alexis, we can go to the next one. Survey of the existing property. Uh, we can skip this one for the most part for right now. We may go back to it. And could you just zoom in on the site plan? Thanks, Alexis. We are proposing 
some modifications to the site, um, remediating some of the trouble areas. Uh, we had solid waste issues with both our par portion of the building and the adjacent property. What you see is a proposed double bin cycle and trash enclosure on the north side of the property that's going to be shared by both suites. Um, the problematic enclosure to the south is to be removed. And we're also cleaning up a little bit of the circulation and in doing so adding additional green space to the property. So we're adding end islands of converting that. That was all uh, impervious before, including some of the space up on the northern side behind the trash receptacles and in the back of the parking lot area. Um, this petition has a dedicated loading zone area. So there's no circulation conflicts or anything. Everything is happening in the back. And then um, all of our bike parking, pedestrian entryways will still be happening from the west side. And that'll be what we would consider the front. Um, we're required to have one class B parking space, but due to some of the other sites uh, in Ann Arbor, we've noticed that the bike parking gets used quite a bit. Um, so we propose four here uh, for this location. And then there's an accessible ramp that has been cleaned up so that it, it meets the accessible route requirements to get into the building. Um, Alexis, we can go on to the floor plan. Next seat, next sheet. Thank you. And actually, sorry, for one second, can you go back to the previous sheet? I think it's probably easier to see it in the area sheet, the top left portion. So what you see there in like the teal color um, is the existing adjacent suite. It's an automobile uh, truck repair facility. Um, this petition is proposing to the grow facility is the permitted use within M1A, and then the provisioning center is what you see in the gold color. It's our program actually picks these colors by at random. They just happen to be sort of Michigan, so it's not pandering. I swear. <laughs> um, okay, Alexis, we can go to the floor plan now. Thank you. Uh, the vestibule location is existing. The glass location on that wall is existing um, and we're repurposing sort of just all the back of house stuff here. Um, there would be a shared lobby area for vendors for the grow facility for clients coming in potential investors um, anything like that and then the provisioning center would be on the far side over there We're, we still see the main entry for that coming off of the main parking or to the western parking lot so pedestrian entryway would be through that way um, the entry from the east side that you see where it says secured vestibule, that will be used for product delivery um, to both facilities if there's anything that gets, um, has to go through and be vetted and can be set in secure storage and before it gets sent to the grow or into the rest of the building. Um, as far as other improvements to the site, there are no proposed additions at this time. Um, we are going to uh, we we do the exterior, there's some painting and some remediation of the roof and stuff that, that they just require some, some love. Um, but I think uh, I'll leave it at that. Other than the one, one thing that I do want to touch on that's uh, a slightly different than what was in our operation manual. One of the things that we've uh, been trying to battle nowadays uh, is the, the issues that we have with COVID and how it impacts retail spaces. Uh, sort of dual purpose here. We have listed HEPA filters and carbon filters as a way to remediate odors. But one thing that's not on there that we are doing standard practice now in all facilities is a photo ionization bipolar, uh, sorry, bipolar photo ionization filter. Um, it doesn't have UV lights or anything like that. It's just this ionization plasma bar that works in a way that it breaks down indoor pathogens while also destroying odors. That's actually how we found it. Um, this product that we use is called GPS uh, iMod, and they tested it up against, they haven't tested it against COVID-19, but it has shown serious promise against um, SARS. So any of those uh, pathogens that have a shell around the outside or core that have to be broken down first, and they have similar DNA structures like that. And it's been showing to, proven to, to do pretty well, and a lot of hospitals and stuff have already gone to this. Uh, we're doing it any way that we can, any time that we have any sort of unit, um, residential, commercial, um, even in the cultivation area, because it, it also <laughs> increases um, energy efficiency, which uh, by 
reducing the amount of airflow that's needed inside the unit. So it's just another thing that standard practice that's not on there, but it is an extra piece for odor control and for pathog pathogen control in today's world. Great, is there anything else? No. All right. Nothing more from us, thank you. Thank you. Ms. DeLeo. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I will give some highlights from our staff report. Um, I think that um, uh, Mr. Gonzalez has done a very good job of explaining what the proposal is. This is uh, the 2115 South State Street Special Exception Use for an Accessory Marijuana Provisioning Center Marijuana Retailer. Um, the pr uh, primary permitted principal use, as mentioned, will be a marijuana grow facility. Um, uh, in the M1A district, um, standard practice um, that accessory retail is permitted incidental to the primary use. And in this case, the primary use is a marijuana facility and the accessory use is another marijuana facility. Um, <clears throat> in the um, um, staff report, I would like to point out that I had an error, um, actually a couple errors, um, in the surrounding land uses and zoning. The zoning is correct, but the land uses to the west is both office and residential, single family residential. Um, staff report also goes through special exception use standards. There are the general special exception use standards that apply to this special exception use, as well as the specific standards for marijuana facilities. Staff report um, goes through them um, as well. I'll hit on some highlights. Um, it is uh, gen generally consistent with the master plan uh, in compatibility with the general vicinity. Um, regarding consistency with the neighborhood and not being de detrimental. Again, I'd like to point out, I the staff report only mentions the surrounding uses being light industrial retail and office. There is residential in the area um, across the street. There is single family residential and in the surrounding area, there's single family as well as multifamily. Um, parking, uh, the on-site parking meets the needs of both the growth facility, the accessory provisioning center retailer, and the auto um, facility as well. Um, the additional information for marijuana facilities has been provided, um, is attached and referenced. Um, um, although this petition was submitted before, um, it's been submitted for a while um, and in the queue, it was submitted before Special exception uses require type one citizen participation. However, they have um, since um, satisfied that requirement by holding a citizen participation meeting. The year is wrong in the staff report. That's a typo. Um, it should be October 2nd, 2018. Um, but otherwise they held the meeting satisfying the, the current requirements. Staff is recommending approval of the petition. Um, and we have um, the findings in the proposed motion, as well as um, some conditions of approval. The first two conditions are standard, what we have been asking for every um, special exception use. And the third is specific to this um, address um, because we are considering an accessory marijuana provisioning and retail um, sales. We are reiterating that all of the uh, normal UDC requirements for accessory businesses incidental to a primary use um, um, are, shall be um, in effect and maintained. Happy to answer any additional questions. Um, and I know that the applicants are here as well. Thank you very much. Um, now we'll open the public hearing for this item. This is an opportunity for persons to speak for up to three minutes about the proposed 2115 South State Street Special Exception Use Permit. Public comment may be made by calling 877-853-5247 and then entering meeting ID 986-8779-4536. City staff will select callers that have raised their hand one by one by um, 
calling on you by the last three digits of your telephone number, you can digitally raise your hand by pressing star nine. And once you are um, uh, approved to kind of move in to make your public comment, you'll hear an automated mes message that the host is allowing you to speak. When you unmute your phone to speak, please at the same time mute any background noise that you have or move to a quiet area so that we can hear you more clearly. Um, please also state your name and address at the beginning of your comments. And it looks like there is someone on the line who has their hand raised. Caller with the phone number ending with the number 098. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and you have three minutes to address the Planning Commission. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Sure. Sure can. Okay, thank you. My name is uh, David D. Pice. I live at uh, 2096 South State Street. We're the residential property almost directly across from this uh, proposal. Uh, thank you to Alexis for making those corrections on uh, your staff report. It makes my comment a lot shorter. Um, I just want to reemphasize that uh, while this area seems to be a hodgepodge, seems to the outsiders to be a hodgepodge of industrial, commercial, and office. There is still quite a bit of residential use in this area, and that should be, uh, the, the residential component should be an important um, part when evaluating the value or detriment of this project. I read through the operations plan, and boy, that's, uh, there's a lot of information there. And if the developer follows, if the developer follows through with all that's promised, including in the areas of security, odor control, and hiring quality employees, they should be a, a good neighbor. I do have one concern, one question, and one request. My concern is about the traffic. If the develop, developer meets their low cost goals and their future revenue projections as detailed in their uh, plan, it seems like they'll generate more vehicle trips than the 24 daily vehicle trips currently being projected. Also, I'll note on the site plan, they uh, say that the current business, stadium towing, generates 70, 70 plus trips a day. And my uh, personal observation would be that uh, that travel doesn't come anything close to that number of trips currently coming in. I hope during your discussion, someone can talk a little bit more about traffic projections. My question is about energy usage. I thought that Ann Arbor's ordinance for marijuana growers, which is the primary use of this property, required a statement about the facility's energy usage and needs and required the installation of solar panels to help meet that energy usage. Am I wrong about this or is that not part of what's being discussed here tonight? Hope staff can answer that question during your discussion. My final point is about a request about the exterior of the building. As you know, State Street is a major corridor into town. Thirty we'd more like seconds. To see, and we'd, yes, we'd like to see the current exterior improved. Today, it is mostly blank wall with a peeling paint job that doesn't seem particularly welcoming. I hope you encourage the developer to improve the exterior in a tangible way. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much. If there's anyone else who wishes to speak on this petition, you can digitally raise your hand by pressing star nine. I don't see other callers coming calling in and the other person on the line hasn't raised their hand. So I will close the public hearing and read the very long motion. Um, the Ann Arbor City Planning Commission, after hearing all interested persons and reviewing all relevant information, including an accompanying site plan, finds the petition substantially meets the standards in Chapter 55, Unified Development Code, Section 5.29.5.D, Special Exceptions, and Section 5.16.3.G, Marijuana Facility and therefore approves the 2115 South State Street special exception use for an accessory marijuana provisioning center slash marijuana retailer. This approval is based on the following findings. One, the proposed use will be consistent with the MIA, M, M1A, if 
that's a one, not an I, sorry. M1A limited light industrial district, which provides for light industrial uses and accessory retail sales of manufactured products. Two, the proposed use will not adversely impact traffic, pedestrians, bicyclists, circulation, or road intersections based on the location. South State Street provides access to the site and the proposed use is consistent with other surrounding uses traffic impact. Three, a site plan documenting the existing and proposed conditions of the site has been submitted as part of this application. Four, through documentation submitted by the petitioner regarding waste disposal, inventory tracking, security, and other methods of operation of the facility, the provisioning center slash retailer will be operated in a manner that will not have an adverse impact on the neighboring properties or area and will not have a detrimental impact on natural features. This special exception use approval is based on the following conditions. One, the petitioner obtaining and maintaining both a state of Michigan marijuana license and a city of Ann Arbor marijuana permit and providing documentation to planning services within three years of the city planning commission approval date of this petition. Two, the petitioner operating a marijuana business at this address within three years of the city planning commission approval date of this petition. Three, the marijuana provisioning center slash marijuana retail sales are accessory to a permitted primary use marijuana business at 2115 South State Street and meet all applicable requirements for accessory and incidental retail uses provided in Chapter 55 of the Unified Development Code. And that the Ann Arbor Planning Commission approves the attached site plan which demonstrates compliance with the applicable special exception use standards as no development which would otherwise require site plan approval has been proposed. Can I have a commissioner move the motion? Moved by Commissioner Sauvey, seconded by Commissioner Briggs. Commission discussion of the proposal. Anybody want to start us off? Commissioner Milstein. Thank you. A um, couple of things and questions that I, uh, I guess, let me first start with uh, questions. Um, so Mr. Leonard, I remember this was several years ago. Um, there were, I believe at one of our meetings, somebody had uh, appeared to talk about a marijuana provisioning center that they wanted to open up on South State Street, and that parcel was in the township, um, and it was right on State Street, and they they spoke to us briefly. I, I don't remember the extent of it. I just remember thinking about it just because I, I drive by this site on a very regular basis, and I drive down this corridor on a regular basis. So my question is, and we've never run into this scenario that I can think of, um, does the township allow uh, marijuana provisioning centers? And if so, is there a center that's open there or is going to be open there? And would that then cause issues with regards to us and our 600 foot um, distance? Do you know anything about that? Just because I, I strictly remember it being in this in this block that we had this conversation and seeing that the site to the, I think it's the north and the south or the east and the west, whichever direction it is, are both township islands. Do you know anything about that? Um, I recall the conversation. I don't, to my knowledge, it hasn't, been established. Um, uh, the petitioners actually might know that answer more than uh, better than I do about what the other communities allow or don't allow. Um, I am I don't recall, but I don't remember. I, I thought one of the conversations might have been that they were seek seeking to potentially annex because the township wouldn't allow that use at that site. So, um, so I don't think that use came to fruition for those reasons, but I, I would have to go back to that specific site address. Um, as, to, as it relates to the 600 foot requirement, um, because I'm not aware of anything there, it, we, we feel that this one complies with our standards, but I, it's a good question. I, I don't know about our language, how it would apply if there was a facility outside of the city's jurisdiction relative to that. Um, that's something I'd probably have to follow up on with additional research. But the short of it is I'm not aware of another facility in proximity to this one. Okay. I don't know how I feel about that right now. I'm just raising that as a point for other commissioners to maybe think about. So I'm, I'm open to feedback on that. Uh, would you, so that would you be comfortable letting Mr. Finnick weigh in from sort of what his knowledge sure. of other communities? Sure. Thank you. Um, so the township has opted out as of uh, April of 2019, the township has opted out. So 
currently under their ordinance, um, there would not be um, a provisioning center, um, you know, allowed to, or any marijuana facility allowed to operate there. And second, if I may speak just briefly to the, uh, to, you know, hypothetically speaking, if there were to be another um, facility within the jurisdiction, in another jurisdiction, um, I think that that would, uh, and, and, I, and again, I had a bit of a hand in drafting the ordinance, uh, Ann Arbor's or opt-in ordinance. So I'm, I, I remember, you know, we would, we were discussing the, the buffers and whatnot. And um, it would kind of be like a school, even if there were a school that was not in the city of Ann Arbor, but it was within a thousand feet of that facility, it would still create um, a problem for that facility within Ann Arbor. And uh, I think in this hypothetical, I would probably apply that same, um, that same logic, where if there were a provisioning center already there, that um, somebody would not be able to put one in within 600 feet, regardless of whether or not it's a township island, and then vice versa. So I hope that's helpful. Well, I don't know if I'd agree with the regards that, you know, the township may have other standards at that point. So if, if someone decided to open up in the township island, I'm just, just the reason why I bring this up is because we had someone early on that had this conversation with us. And I'm just, you know, and I also, I, I, I do want to get, you know, I guess some more guidance in regards to what the township is doing. Cause I, I feel like, you know, the conversation has been ongoing um, at least from the little information that I've seen, uh, a lot of townships are, are looking into this. So I, I'm just going to leave this up to other commissioners if, if somebody else would like to discuss it to see if this is a concern uh, of theirs. Um, it would really, uh, you know, it really impact us to have, you know, two uh, marijuana provisioning centers right next door to each other. Um, so just something to uh, think about. Um, Next uh, piece, Commissioner, Commissioner Melchior. I would just, um, I'm just looking up the language, and I would, I would concur with Mr. Fennick that our ordinance isn't specific that that site is within 600 feet on a city of Ann Arbor jurisdiction property or anywhere else. Um, so I, I just want to concur that I think that that is an act. I would agree with that read and interpretation of it. Um, I, um, and I'm happy to follow up on. I would have to follow up more to um, see if they have any intention of revisiting that opt out. Um, I don't know the details of that, um, but um, I can confirm that there are no licensed facilities within the 600 feet currently, regardless of jurisdiction. Okay. I think I would I feel also, better. I can add that um, direct from the Ann Arbor Township Zoning Ordinance, that it's one sentence. Marijuana provisioning center or dispensary is not a permitted conditional or accessory use in any zoning district. I can't speak to their future plans, but they're, they currently are prohibited. And I don't expect us to know what their future plans are. I would, it would be great if we could at the very least, you know, just um, maybe not necessarily for this site, but for future sites, if they are, if there are township islands or it's very close to another municipality to know where they stand with, you know, are they developing something? Is something in the works um it might be something for us to know um once again i don't know if this is an issue for for me necessarily i just would like to get a little bit more information but i'm also just going to see if my colleagues um have any feedback on that um and then next piece i want to talk about was in regards to uh, energy usage um our caller um had uh brought that up um, I guess the question, the petitioner, um, do you have any knowing a little bit more about what's happening with Ann Arbor with our uh, plans in the next uh, decade? Um, do you, are there any plans for uh, solar panels on the site? So currently that is not uh, part of the, um, of the plans at this point. Um, this, uh, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not totally familiar with when the solar panel requirement would, uh, you know, kicks in for new projects or for, you know, if it's, is it only for like a, you know, newly constructed buildings um, or things that require site plan approval. I I'm not sure when it would uh, trigger for a project, but this, this was um, filed in 2018, which I believe was, uh, well before the A20 um, 
ordinance and uh, our commitment and um, any ordinance surrounding it were came into play. But I will say that um, best practices in the industry right now for cultivation facilities uh, is for the use of LEDs as opposed to um, high pressure sodium bulbs and they're far more energy efficient than anything that was uh used in the past so um that's you know that's the direction they'd be headed for the commission uh for background um we have we have to this point solely focused on the petition which is for the accessory provisioning center and retailer um we have, I have not discussed at all um, anything related to the applicant regarding the primary use. Um, the grow facility is a permitted use. Um, they can open at any point and they could have already opened. They have chosen to have the two uses run um, or develop simultaneously. But when they do submit, um, they, so at this point we haven't discussed their permitted use. Um, hasn't even been part of the conversation when they do submit building permits um, for their uh, primary use we will make discuss all of the requirements with them as well as do all of the enforcement necessary now um, specific there is a specific requirement for a marijuana grower or a marijuana micro business to include 10 percent of its energy uses um, via solar panels um, one of the reasons why we haven't discussed it too much with the applicants right now, um, they were going to be a processing facility at first. They've changed their business plan to a grow facility. Again, all fine. Both are permitted principal uses, and that is within their purview to their permitted principal uses. So when they finalize what their pr primary use is, um, we'll and apply all of the um, standards and regulations there at this point they're indicating they're going to be a grow facility which is fine when they do those permits and apply for all of their permits and licenses and um, um, certificates of occupancy we'll handle all of those um, development requirements then for that side of it the before the planning commission is ju we've just been talking about the accessory retail got it I believe in others we've asked petitioners to add some sort of solar for when it's been provisioning centers. Have we not asked for for solar? Does anybody? I, I guess I'd like to you know I'd like to maybe push back on that a little bit and just see you know we do now have a plan and I understand um, that this application was made in 2018, but at the same time um, this is a special exemption use. Which is very different than some of the other things that we've we've uh, we've seen. Um, the other issue is: is the towing facility still going to remain on site? Is that the plan? Somebody from the petitioners team can answer. Yes. There's. Okay. Um, and is the gate going to stay in place that we see uh pictured um and photos just because the gate looks like it would be a no. gate that would so the gate's going away yes okay and then are there um actually are um, there one, one thing back backwards the towing company is no longer going to be there but the truck repair facility is going to remain got it okay and then um, are there plans to make any improvements to the building, visual improvements to the building? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Can you discuss uh, what those changes are since that was one of the pieces of feedback that we received? Sure. So um, at, at the absolute very least, it does require stripping of the exterior paint because it is peeling. Uh, they have to resurface the roof, potentially replace depending on um, the status of that. Uh, inspection. It's uh, standard practice for us to go through and give it a, a little bit more of a contemporary feel. Um, we usually add hardy board and Nietzsche panels, which are fiber cement long life lead time items that will add a little bit of visual depth to the wall that you build them, pack them out slightly. So it adds a little bit of shadow gap. There is no in, uh, we're not intending to add any windows to the side because um, it doesn't work very well in your grow rooms when you have natural light getting 
push through there. So unfortunately, having that uh, a, a, a tight space for the growth facility, we can't add additional windows. Sometimes we can get around it by the way we work our corridors, but in this case, we could only add windows on the backside. Okay. So it's, it's a reskinning, painting, and general upkeep of, of everything on the exterior. How about landscaping? Um, there is I drive, a, just uh, the reason I, I drive by yeah. the site probably five times a day. So I'm <laughs> very familiar with it and the lack of landscaping that's there. It does have, um, it does need a little bit of love, yes, on the exterior of the landscaping. Um, as of right now, we use, um, it, it, satis it has street trees and it has exterior trees, but we bring in um, Casey Runsman to do landscaping plans for the exterior of the building once it's, it's up. Um, but in terms of just general, we, we claim those as green space at the moment, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're lawn. Um, it's usually low plantings or some sort of ornamental grass or something up in the front. Um, and then if we can fit it, I think in the island to the south, a tree would be appropriate. Sorry, I can't see Alex anymore. Is the screen share helpful or I can take it down? Um, I, I'm good. I, it's, they, it always looks pretty on the screen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so thank you. Um, and then one last thing and then I'll, I'll hand it off. Um, so I noticed that our motion uh, does not have anything about hours, which we typically see, hours of operation. Um, can we include that? I know it's part of the operational plan, but can we include that in the motion? Um, unless somebody has an objection to it. I think it's, let's just keep up that standard since we, we've seen it across all the, all the other motions that we made in regards to uh, special exempt, ex exemption uses. So um, I'll wait for feedback from others and then I will make that amendment. Thank you. And may I clarify one thing that the towing company, I don't want there to be any confusion. The towing yard will remain um, on the site in the back. However, that, location um they and, and and they will be removing the gate um but that location uh it's really only used for uh football saturdays and towing off of uh the golf course so um to clarify it will it will remain but just to uh you know to kind of describe the pattern of use there it's very it's it's, a, it's used very minimally is there anything else that you had at alex okay commissioner gibrandel so i'm a little confused on what we're approving in some ways because when we had done our um our discussion i don't know was that about a year ago or something where we were talking about you know, covering 10% with solar and all that kind of 10% of their energy needs with solar. So that does not get approved at this stage. Ms. Leo. Like um, it is not approved. It is not a requirement of the provisioning center or retailer. But that is a right. all, yeah, all provisioning center retailers are special exception uses, whether right. they are principal or accessory. Now, um, in the M1A district, there are a couple marijuana businesses that are just permitted. And um, including those are processing facilities and grow facilities. Um, it is entirely the um, applicant's choice when to open that, that primary business. They just have chosen not to do it yet. Um, yeah, but so they it's not will need to be this application. Right. It's they not, will, they could, they could here. have done it yesterday. They could have done it two years ago. Um, when they apply for permits, which won't go through the planning commission because they permitted use when they apply permits though, we'll look at their permits, apply all the development standards. Um, they'll, and they'll also have to apply for their permits with the uh, city clerk and the state. So we will apply the regulations for grow facilities when they open the grow facility I so that it's parallel to this but it's not part of this um okay 
Um, and like I said, they had they they could open, but they're choosing, and it's fine. But they are choosing to wait and do all construct all renovations at the same time. Okay. Oh, and I just just to be crystal clear, if they proceed with the grow facility, they will um, submit permits to build out the space. Um, they will as part of that. We will review those permits not only for building codes, but to make sure that. They are meeting, in this case, the 10% renewable energy standard that you set forth. So if they're going to do a grow or micro business, they will have to demonstrate compliance with that. Then we will issue the permits. They will conduct that, be inspected, and then ultimately approved. As, uh, as Alexis is indicating, if they were to change their business model and shift that to a processing facility, we don't right. have that same requirement for solar right. panels. They would, right. That would not be pertinent to that permit. It would just be more focused on building permit requirements. Um, and we don't have the standard of um, for provisioning centers or retailers right. either. Right. To uh, Commissioner Milstein's uh, question, um, you know, part of the special exception use is compliance with master plan. So that is a conversation you can have with, with the petitioners. Um, I think the my my thought is that you know we set that standard sort of as a more automatic to sort of take some of the judgment out of that, um, and I I think um, I don't think we've actually had a lot of grow facilities come to the planning commission. I think most of our conversation about solar um, has actually been with just larger other types of projects because they're often just a permitted use in those zone districts. So. Right. Right. Okay. That's that's very helpful to know. Um, and I guess what I would just suggest to the petitioner is see what's on the horizon. That's coming if you become a grow facility and that if you are doing plans now, you might think about your roof loading and you know the things where you're getting conduit up to your roof and all those kinds of issues that would come with that because um, that is something that we are expecting of grow facilities. And I just wanna give you a little bit of context here. They are massive energy hogs in huge ways. We can literally undo our carbon neutrality goals if we had some decent sized growing facilities in this area. It is incredible how much energy grow facilities use. And I hope that the petitioner and the owners are listening to this because as an industry, I think you all have to take some responsibility for this because the crazy energy use that you all are um, creating by growing indoors 24 seven with unbelievable amounts of LED lights are having an impact on the rest of us in terms of emissions. So please think about the big picture with this because you need to as an industry. We are taking a small step in this, but I would really hope that you all start to have discussions with colleagues and people across the industry to start to take responsibility for what this really means in terms of your carbon footprint on this planet. It's really serious if you start looking into the impact that you all have. So we're only gonna require so much. This doesn't look like a massive grow facility, but I just wanna impress upon you that this is a really serious thing and that I hope you all take it seriously. I have a few other things I wanna ask about too. Um, uh, we usually get exterior elevations from you all when you come before us. Was there a reason you, because I think that's something we've kind of come to expect that like the last time you were in front of us, you had exterior elevations. So um, I guess that's something that, uh, I don't know if that's part of their checklist or not in terms of staff, but um, I think it's something that is nice for us to be able to see um, about what, what's going to be happening from the road. I know it's gonna be more closed off because it's a growth facility and that you have limitations uh, in terms of windows, um, but that's something that I think that should be kind of a, a, a standard um, piece of, the, um, of what you all bring before us because I, I can't remember many that didn't have that um, as part of what they submitted. Um, and then, um, let me see, there was one other thing. Oh, I know, um, so, uh, around your bike parking, there was grass and it's on a, on a concrete pad, but I would like to make sure you are connecting um, the place where the bikes have to, you know, what, whatever way you're, you're getting them there, whether it's kind of through the parking lot or from the, the sidewalk that gets there, make sure that there's a, 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 um, a connection that is pavement all the way um, in through there. 
and that I would hope that some of those parking lot islands uh, that you are creating, which you know, I'm glad you're taking some of those out of impervious surface, but I think that it would be excellent to add some canopy trees in places that wouldn't preclude you from being able to do the solar that you may need to do. Um, but I think some of those ones towards the back um, uh, on the east side um, uh, would be appropriate for something like that. So um, I think any way that you can shade the pavement is, is a good thing. So those, uh, those, were my, those were my questions. And then I guess the only thing um, left was um, what the neighbor brought up around traffic. Um, and I would just say from my own kind of personal observations of, of walking by some of these facilities, there's a lot of traffic actually. I've been surprised by how many cars pull in and out of these things. And so I'm just wondering uh, from staff if there are, I'm not saying that you know we need a traffic light here, but have, has there become more kind of fine-tuned understanding of the traffic in and out of these facilities, given that the percent of retail that is there and things like that, is there, that's, has that become any more known as um, they have been locating in Ann Arbor and, and that we're kind of getting some, you know, meaningful patterns on the ground? I don't know if staff have any or, 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 or the petitioner, frankly, if there's any, um, it just, it seems like there are, there is a lot, and there's a lot of in and out I've, I've noticed. So do we have anything staff wise in terms of like understanding that in a more fine tuned way? I know they probably don't have to do a, a traffic analysis, I would imagine. Um, but have you all been kind of noticing things or getting any reports from people or things like that, that would just allow us to become a little bit more um, aware of what is, is happening with the actual patterns on the ground. I know that um, from speaking to our traffic engineers that um, this is a new land use and the, the Bible for the traffic engineers is the ITE manual, which is the Institute of Transportation Engineers. They study all land uses basically. They average them out, they produce um, manuals about expected trip generation and it's um, a chart based on size of the use. Um, they have charts for urban locations and rural and semi and suburban, um, but um, they don't have much data, the ITE Institute, or they don't have much data. The data that they do have um, often was collected and analyzed um, in Colorado and other states that were the first adopters. And that was also, it was heavily skewed towards medicinal uh, provisioning centers or medical card centers. Um, so our traffic engineers um, are using that, the, the published information, as well as their local expertise, local knowledge, um, and they are, uh, working on it as they go, as all transportation engineers are. I, I'm under the impression from our traffic engineers that what we're seeing is the traffic slash trips are not, uh, have not caused um, problems. But we, we have been seeing pre-pandemic parking. There's been parking complaints, parking concerns, that uh, we are treating the, the marijuana facilities as just general retail use for parking standards. And they are, um, that may be low. Um, that more on-site parking more than trip generation is the initial impressions that were, that feedback is coming back. Um, this site has, um, by having two, a couple of uses on it, it's a bigger building, it has a little bit more parking, um, might be a better fit than some others because there's a little bit extra here for parking overflow. During the pandemic, some of the provisioning centers are offering um, like curbside pickup, um, not exactly drive-throughs, it's not like they're adding windows, but they're offering other things that um, have quicker turnover, less parking needs. Um, so it's a long way of saying the traffic engineers recognize that they don't have ideal data, but they are collecting it. They are continually um, trying to figure out the, what the right mix is, what the right thresholds are. 
and the pandemic is throwing a, a wrench in the works. And I think we're all just trying to use some common sense. Um, in this particular case, in my common sense, there's a center turn lane in State Street. So turning movements should be better than other locations. And there is um, some decent extra, there's a lot of asphalt here. And in this case, we can use that to our advantage. Otherwise, um, it, this is a um, use your best judgment in this case because it's such a new land use. Yeah, yeah, that's that's helpful. I wondered, and I'm just curious from the petitioners, you know, um, Mr. Fennick and both of you actually have been involved in quite a few of these projects. Just and and again, I'm not saying go and do a traffic study or like have a light in front of your facility. I'm just curious from your own experience with several of these, you know, because you both have done quite a few projects in town, just for our own understanding as, as we live with these more, what is, what are your impressions? Do you feel like that number is low? Like what, what's your, what's your, I do based on sort of what I see in some in my neighborhood, but I don't know, I, you know, I'm not sitting there all day checking things off either. So. All right. I want to sec second what uh, Alexis had said. I, I think that on a lot of these sites, it was it was more of a parking issue than a trips issue, um, especially when you have like a 1,200 square foot standalone structure or 1,500 square foot standalone structure. Those become almost impossible to park. Once you get the minimum and the maximum, it's like six and seven or something like that. Um, and then you take away one of those as a full, fully van accessible space, you're, you're really operating under the gun to get people in and out and then you need a little bit extra space so i think that that causes a little bit extra impervious because you need circulation space and overflow space a little bit um which at times can be hard to sell to you guys um <laughs> as to why we need it but uh, i would say from a, a, a trip standpoint that you get different peaks you know it's it's not um right constant, that's kind of my sense yeah and it's it's not at the same time as um, general um, you know, rush hour traffic. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that you get ebbs and flows during the day. And that's why most of these facilities, I mean, you, you see them opening at 10 o'clock. That's uh, um, far past the, the AM peak hours that you'd see right. for rush hour traffic. So I, I think trips can be an issue if um, the artery is not big enough to handle it. But I think State mm -hmm. Street is, is adequate. Um, but parking, I think will always be uh, a struggle with these facilities. I mean, I don't, I don't know if the, if the largest size facility that you guys have or the maximum parking that it has, but um, the smaller ones will, will struggle. And if I may add, um, just anecdotally to what is happening in town, um, uh, first of all, the, the ITE metric is, it does account for recreational sales as well. And so it was kind of, you know, applying that um, metric to Ann Arbor prior to um, uh, rec passing in Michigan, it was already that that those trips are kind of baked in already. And that 24 number that the caller mentioned, um, that's a peak. Those are peak. Not that that's not throughout the day, but that's like peak hours. Got it. So okay. um, just to clarify that part, but you know, really aside from that first couple, those first couple days where we had rec sales that started and there was, you know, uh, one or two shops in town that were like the first, some of the first few that had recreational sales. And admittedly that, you know, created some issues. Um, we, we really haven't seen a lot of uh, traffic um, concerns. I will echo what Kyle mentioned in terms of the, uh, in terms of the um, parking situation, you know, in, in certain on certain projects that we've worked on before there, are, you know, we're parking issues. And um, frankly, with curbside now, and whenever that, that executive order is lifted, then, you know, they'll rethink the model, but also, you know, it's not a large, uh, it, there's not a lot of space inside the actual provisioning center. So the model is really going to be a thought of, there's gonna be a lot of delivery, you know, the goal would be delivery and um, also uh, app based purchases so that people are just basically buying online and then coming there and the trips are real short. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't anticipate and based on, like, like I said, based on what we've seen from other locations that have a larger facility, a smaller parking lot and um, uh, on, you know, a main artery, even at peak times, 
where we're just really not seeing a, a, a ton of congestion in that area. Okay, thank you. That's it for me. Commissioner Briggs. Um, just a couple of things that haven't gotten discussed yet. Um, reading through the uh, citizen participation meeting that you had, it sounded like the there were just a couple of folks that attended that and the business owner had some concerns around parking, which seemed like that they got um, addressed satisfactorily. Um, the, the one piece that um, one of the neighbors had brought up was um, I think issues maybe around security and discussions around your lighting plan had been something that um, was brought forward in terms of addressing those concerns and you these sometimes um, the sense of lighting as um, equating to safety is uh, something that we're trying to address a little bit in the city obviously lighting can help um, is important in, in a um, to some degree in terms of safety but um, we also are on the um, brink of adopting a dark skies ordinance which is complementing our um, carbon neutrality goals as well and so just wanted to get a sense of better of what that lighting plan looks like um, obviously it's not in our ordinance yet and so you haven't been able to take a good look at it but for um, kind of broadly speaking you know we're, we're we're ideally we're not requiring parking lots to be lit all night long um, it's something that they in the future that they can be lit but at a lower level of lighting it would be really shielding lights um, much more effectively. Um, so if you could just talk a little bit about what you're thinking about doing. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, standard practice, we use all dark sky compliant fixtures uh, whenever we are doing any exterior lighting. There's no plan for anything way out in the parking lot or anything like that. But from a security standpoint, we like to light the perimeter of the building and all fixtures would be down lights that are, it's. It's a Lithonia WST, if you wanted to look that up later, but um, we have no problem complying with that and adding that in the, um, if we get approved okay. as a condition. Great, and if you could kind of think about, I think from the neighbor's perspective, they may not. Uh, we don't want to get anywhere near the property line with the light bleed. Yeah, exactly, and if it's possible, I mean, I think it's just a lot nicer actually to have that, have those lights um, super low at nighttime or or off um, if possible. Um, and then just to uh, go back, I can't remember which commissioner brought this up now, just the, in terms of the, I think it was Commissioner Milstein, in terms of the hours of operation, that's another, P I agree that those should be in the, um, in the, um, whatever, <laughs> not a lot of words, but the piece around, um, I was looking at the hours of operation, they seem a little bit later than I remember um, us passing, but it's been a while since we've had one of these um, next to a residential area. And so it seemed like my, it's, I, I seem to recall that 8 p.m. might have been closing hours, but I don't wanna, my memory is not always greatest on these sorts of things. So I just thought maybe um, that could be double checked what we've done in the past so we can be consistent with that. Um, and I think that's, that's it from my perspective. Thank you. Commissioner Sauvé. Uh, just a couple of things. The first is for accessory use. Is there a limit on square footage in terms of how we have this squared out for what we're approving? Alexis. I'm just trying to understand. So like uh, on the map, the provisioning center is called out at 216 square feet, but it's also landlocked. So if nothing else happens and they just open the provisioning center without the grow, they don't have exterior entry. So I'm just trying to understand how square footage is calculated for that use if you can't actually access the use. Um, so two things. Um, uh, first, uh, and maybe foremost, um, they cannot open the, this, this provisioning center until the principal use, the primary use is opened. Okay. Um, but then second, so we've um, gone over the floor plan um, a couple different times. And our standard was essentially, you need to be able to cut off the provisioning center 
um, floor area. I'll pull up the floor plan. Cut it off and then there's, and without any effect to the principal use. Um, Got it. Nope, that makes sense. So I'll screen share. And I know it takes a second there. Somebody shout when it's loaded. You're there. Okay. So, so um, they're a little, they're a tiny bit undersized um, based on the 10%, but this is the only space that is the sole purpose is the retail space. All of the other facilities are shared um, and are needed for the grow facility. Um, um, so, or they could pivot and make it a processing facility or, or some other permitted use. But um, this vestibule and storage, um, it serves both facilities and it's only this retail space that its sole purpose and no other reason for being is the, um, um, is this um, space here. Um, and that was our, uh, th that is the way that we um, determine when you have um, whatever principal use and an accessory retail in the industrial district. I recognize that for um, these, uh, the marijuana uses um, businesses come with a little extra baggage, um, state requirements for secure openings and storage and lock boxes and all kinds of things that the applicants know a little bit more about which is a little bit extra burden than say if this was um, a rubber band factory and they're just having, and they're selling some rubber bands um, in the showroom. Um, but um, it is what it is for them. It's their sort, they have a small space, so they get a small retail facility, but that was where, um, how we determine what counts to what, and you will need to be, and here you can cut off this retail space or close it and have no effect on the grow facility. Okay. And I did mention, did I, that um, they can't um, open the, all right, I'm nodding, okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, my other question was on signage. Uh, in the community meeting, there was talk about concern of traffic going into the neighboring property and parking there. And that signage, additional signage would be included to clarify where to enter. Um, but since we don't have any elevations and I don't see any kind of marquee signs or anything on the site plan, I'm curious from the petition, petitioner if there's additional signage planned and what that's going to look like. I can address one tiny component before Kyle answers. Um, because signage is not part of site plan approvals, we typically tell people actually leave it off. We don't want to imply that anything has been approved, reviewed or approved. Signage requires a separate sign permit. So um, yes, no elevations were provided. Even if they were, there probably wouldn't be any signage. We typically tell people to take it off. Um, and, um, and I'll let Kyle answer their plans though. Uh, at this point, we'd still be, we are still designing what we would put on the outside, uh, but at any way, we we're comfortable putting something in there as a condition uh, that we will work with that neighbor to get something that they agree with, and that will satisfy the requirement of making sure the traffic doesn't flow over into their property. Um, okay. it, that was kind of just the other, you know, looking at the site plan and how the kind of driveway blends between them a little bit more. Yeah, it's oh. a pretty strange situation. So, it, and I mean, and, and it's, it's odd, right? We're talking about trip counts and drop-offs versus how much parking, but since we're concerned with parking on the adjacent one, um, I think that would be important to make sure that we've got clarification on the parking area, uh, especially because it came up in comments too. Um, I mean, and that's, it goes to other elevation issues. If this is grow, seeing where solar panels are on the roof, if they're on the facade side, if they're on the back side of this, if they all fit or not, or if we're gonna start seeing carport solar panels for this. Um, Cause you know, like Commissioner Gibrandle said, it's a, it's a big energy suck and 10% 10, 10 might be more than the roof area you have. 
um, to kind of see how this really plays out to get, capture it. Um, we, um, we've been tiering our lights um, with the LEDs too, so it's not just one size LED fits all. Um, there's three different varieties and they go back and forth between the two, but essentially they come, they're about half of what the old grow lights used to be in terms of um, wattage and that converts to BTUs, which means that we actually use a lot less energy on the air conditioning side. Um, and another strategy is to Have use you done? It. I'm sorry? Have you I'm done sorry. calculations on approximately what would be required for the grow? No, we have not done the calculations for the solar panels on this side yet. That's uh, part of that is because we have to size the VRF system, the mechanical side, to understand our mm -hmm. full um, energy load. Okay. That's all I have for now. Commissioner Abrams, but while I'm doing this, I don't, uh, before you go, um, Commissioner Briggs brought up like hours and uh, if somebody's doing research, I've been trying to type it in. Great. I was thinking the one on Packard by um, Oz Music um, is kind of, is a similar kind of a neighborhood setting. Um, also, there's the one that's on, it's behind the 7-Eleven off of state. I don't know what that little road is there, but that's, an, those were the two that came to my mind. Sorry. Now, Commissioner Abrams. Oh, I was going to ask a question also about hours, or just um, Commissioner Briggs. Did you did you refer to hours which were submitted for this facility? I didn't see that anywhere. Where? Yeah, they're they're in the operations plan, and they are um, they probably know them off the top of their head, but they are Monday, to Saturday, yeah, ten to nine, and then Sunday ten to six. Which I think the Sunday hours seem typical. I it just. I just can't remember what we've done in the past, but I remember for a while there we had these so many in a row that we were pretty consistent about it, and it's it's been a little while since we've had one. So. Um, maybe I could just uh, use a little bit of direction from staff. Is is like is that within the purview of this body to determine to re approve hours of operation? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then oh no, hold on. It's going to slip. Oh, I know. Sorry. Uh, also, it's just some clarification from staff. So uh, it's, this conversation has been very useful for me and uh, many of my questions have been answered. Um, but this distinction between the, the permitted use and the special exception use, I just want a little bit of clarification here. So when what, will there be a moment when this body sees a site plan for the permitted use? No, right? Okay, so the kind of questions about the solar, there will not be any other opportunity where these questions around solar could, would arise, but it's just written into the ordinance. So, okay. Um, and are elevations a required part of this? They're not a required part of this submission or we would see them. Is it always the case that, that elevations are not required for, yeah, okay. We, uh, All my questions are just nods and shakes. <laughs> hey, just as, a, as, a, as it relates to the architectural elevations, um, you may recall recently we uh, updated some, uh, a reorganization of our site plan content requirements. And we more specifically created one for conditions such as this for special exception uses where no, what we say, no physical development is occurring. That is, um, is applying a special exception use to an existing building. And so through that, through those requirements, we have limited the content that is required for such site plans and architectural elevations are not part of that. Okay. We can revisit that in the future, but they, they're not required. Okay, no, that makes sense. Uh, okay, thank you. That's all I had. Commissioner Hammerschmidt. So I had a question for staff, um, and I could be remembering this incorrectly since it's been a while since we've talked about anything marijuana related, and I was not on the commission when you guys were approving lots and lots of things, but is there a limit on the number of special exception use permits that we can give out for the provision centers? There is. It's 28, and this is number 28. Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> All right. Um, 
So what would happen, that's interesting, what would happen if, if this was approved, but for some reason, like the growth is, like if somebody came in behind them, would they, like, what would happen if this didn't end up opening? Would we give like a, you're next in line? Um, we have a wait list. Um, fun fact, they were on it and uh, they were 29. Um, the planning commission denied one uh, so, so we accepted 28 initial applications um, approximately two years ago um, on our on our opening day, and um, we had a few who asked to remain on a wait list. Planning Commission denied one application, and so um, when that was firmly um, done, um, this one became this one was called up. Um, and we have one or two. We are. We must tell people. Um, you can. We'll take your application, and it can. You can remain waiting. But we have no idea if and when you'll ever come off the wait list. Um, we have twenty. We are by code. We can give out twenty-eight special exception uses and twenty-eight licenses. Um, you have three years to activate the um, and to open the business. We are still within the window of what was first approved. Um, it has not been three years since we started accepting applications and approving. Um, so there is a, and I would say totally off the cuff, half have opened um, or are opening and the other half, um, I, I personally am not too sure about, but they have time. Um, most of them have time to, to open. So first we have to wait until the window for opening um, expires and then we have to figure out calling people off the wait list. Um, they still need to meet all the other requirements though, spacing requirements, um, and they're, they have to figure out whether they're at their, they can hold the lease for that long and so forth, but um, I think I'm getting a little off track. But um, we, we have a short wait list. It seems like most people have actually not, not many people are on it because it's so, um, uh, unknown, but yeah, 28 is the limit. We have 28 and we're still in the window for uh, what's going to happen to the original bunch. Is that a little, uh, just a little bit more refined to that of the 27 that have been approved already. Um, uh, eight of those have not yet received the required state license to operate a provisioning center. Um, the deadline for those ranges from March of 2021 to November of 2022. Okay, so we could potentially see more if that doesn't get doesn't get approved. So is that what took so long? Like I know you you said like the date of the um, citizen participation meeting was 2018. Is it because of the waitlist that this took so long to get before us? Okay. Well, there was um, litigation also um, for the prior one that was denied. And that took the better part of a year to get resolved. Um, they were waiting, you know, this project, um, we were initially were told we were 28 and, you know, we started the process of doing a review and then, um, you know, we had to kind of hit the brakes when um, uh, we were told that we need to wait until the litigation was resolved. And so um, it took, uh, yeah. it took a while. Yeah, I was that was I was really confused with that date, like why, but that that all makes a lot more sense. I would, um, I, I would also just add that I, um, this petition also got um, I bounced this around my our team a little bit, so I think we just also had some processing delays, and so my apologies to the petitioners on that. But um, but I think the bigger the more significant issue was basically waiting for the ability that we knew that we had a permit to issue. Right, all of my other things were addressed previously, so I think that's it. Thank you. And if I may speak to ours um, really quickly, because I, I just pulled up um, some other locations in town. Um, the, the location you were speaking of next to, other um, that you were speaking of next to the 7-Eleven, their hours, um, they're 9 to 9 p.m. Um, and then, you know, Bloom on Miller, um, I'm thinking of all the places that are near kind of like housing developments or um, neighborhoods. They, they have hours until nine. Um, but I do, 
you know, in every other project that, that um, I've been involved with, there, there's always language and the conditions in terms of hours. And it has varied a little bit. I think in the beginning, some of the first few that were approved, their hours might have been a little different than, um, you know, than after a couple, you know, you saw a couple more of them. So, and then the one on Packard by Oz Music, that one, um, you know, uh, I believe it's 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. as well. But um, so, but I would, I, we would agree that um, hours in the conditions is completely uh, appropriate and it was expected. I honestly, I didn't look at the, uh, I didn't look at the resolution um, for that part. So but we're, you know, we fully expect that to be included. Excellent. Um, anything else? I know that I'm expecting a motion for a, a to, for, to amend. Um, I have something else to add. Do you have want is, are you making that motion, Alex, or not yet? I was going to, but go ahead and I'll make it, it after you're done. Okay, so I was just going to, and um, I was going to actually make a motion too. Actually, it's a separate amendment though, um, that kind of picks up on a couple of threads. So I think that we kind of discussed the traffic, which is there's the ITE that effectively comes up with those numbers and established kind of what time that is. So I think that's taken care of. Um, I think that most of my other questions, like again, thinking about what limits to put on this given the prox uh, given what we've done to other um, projects or other um, special exception uses is appropriate. To that end, I know a, an, a lot of those other projects, you know, there's been, I feel like they've all had some kind of weird sidewalk issue. <laughs> Many of them had a lot of sidewalk issues. And this one I don't think is the case because this the safe street has just been redone. Is that fair? I haven't been that way in a while. So actually I'm, is that fair that the sidewalk is in decent condition here? Okay. That also like that we don't see, I, I know that the one that's over by Oz music comes to mind, like the idea of making sure that the paint that it was repainted was a big deal. Like I remember that us being us talking about that. And so the motion that I would be, especially because we haven't seen, um, we haven't seen kind of the, uh, whatever the plan that shows, you know, the facade. I was thinking that it might be appropriate to make a motion that uh, to add a condition contingent upon like facade improvements, which at minimum need to include like repainting. Um, because I think that that's really, I think that's really, I mean, I know that that's the petitioner's intent, but I don't think it's unreasonable given what we've asked of other special exception uses. Is that, if I make that motion, will someone, th that effectively a motion to amend um, the petition or the language to add a condition that there be physical improvement to the facade at least repainting the facade the for the you, you referenced uh, another petition the condition placed on that uh, petition was exterior improvements including repainting of the building and new lighting um, i would say a version of that that you were referencing might be um, architectural exterior improvements um, at a minimum, including repainting of the building. Um, but to be clear that that is, that's leaving some discretion and judgment, um, which I, I'm happy. I think that the petitioners and, and staff can, can satisfy that. Um, and just setting at that high level sets the expectation clearly that, that there has to be a plan to address the aesthetics of that building. I'm not worried about it. Our experience with these facilities is that they're done at a high quality nature. They tend to look really nice, but we can memorialize it in that way. Totally agreed. My experience has been that these like are aesthetic improvements in almost every single situation. Um, so I just want to make sure that we've got some guarantee for that. So I like what you read. Um, the lighting part is not 
other than it was brought up so and that there it was discussed um maybe the the addition of the lighting would be lighting that complies with that is dark skies compliant and just put that in now M seconded by commissioner milstein and can then I make it and can i make a friendly amendment to that absolutely can we add language that says including but not limited to the items that Mr. Lon had mentioned, and can we also add to that list landscaping and also parking lot repaving and restriping? Or I shouldn't say repaving, parking lot improvements, including restriping. Because I actually don't know if it needs to be repaved or not. I That is totally friendly to me. Discussion of that proposed condition. All in favor, please say yes or raise a hand. Any opposed? I don't see any hands. So that's, now we have an amended motion. Is there another? Uh, yes, Commissioner Milstein. And I further would like to amend that the hours operation, the hours of operations are to be Monday, um, Monday through Sunday, uh, uh, I guess, the hours operations are to be at a maximum of Monday through Saturday, 10 to 9, and Sunday, 10 to 6. Um, the reason I say maximum is in case they want to not work those hours. They want to work shorter hours. Must Seconded, work those hours. Seconded by Commissioner Briggs. Any discussion? Commissioner Briggs. Um, just to be consistent, if we had something that was 9 to 9 in another one, I... I think it's reasonable. It doesn't sound like that's their desire, but I don't want to. I just want. I just want to make sure we're consistent with the past, um, whatever that was. <laughs> they've we've um, in the research I've done, we've um, been inconsistent, but there have been many that started at eight or nine, so I think that'd be appropriate. That's friendly. Nine to nine Monday through uh, Saturday. Saturday, and then ten to six on Sunday. Is the 10 to 6 consistent in the past, Mr. Leonard? Um, your previous um, approvals on Sundays have been 9 to 8, 10 to 8, 12 to 7, and no, no hour restrictions. Commissioner Gibrandel? They've done it a lot on the context, so that's partly why we're inconsistent because I think we thought about like, is it in a neighborhood? What are the other businesses that are around it? And what are their hours? I know that we've had some of those discussions before. And so uh, like- but, one Yeah, the, the ones one? the ones I just referenced were um, Bloom, 702 South Main, which is near the 711, the Packard near the Oz Music, um, 617 Packard was one of them. That's downtown the old bakery um, under the record store whose name I'm escaping right now. Um, uh, a Plymouth Road site, and then uh, 202 Miller was the corner of Miller and Ashley and East Ellsworth. So, um, so I, in short, I think nine to nine, Monday through Saturday makes sense. Um, maybe 10 to seven is somewhere in the middle of some of the other residential associated ones. Works for me. And I would, yeah, I, this is zoned M. So like, <laughs> um, it, you know, it, it, there are, there are residences around there that I think we should be sensitive to, but it's, it's, it's a manufacturing zoning, which is kind of the most intense. So Commissioner Abrams. I would be hesitant to limit the hours beyond what, like narrow the hours compared to other ones. I can't imagine there are facility, like this doesn't seem to be, what am I trying to say? There are other businesses in this corridor that are open late, like the o Oasis Hot Tub Gardens, or it, it, I, I don't think, it, so, I mean, if the petitioner's comfortable with it, I guess it's fine, but I'm not sure I feel compelled to limit the, their Sunday hours in a way that's more limited than other facilities, which are maybe in closer proximity to residences. Um, did, was that a question that you posed to the petitioner? Commissioner Abrams? Uh, maybe in a minute, but I would be curious to hear Commissioner Milstein since it's his amendment, yeah. Sure, Commissioner Milstein. So I think the only difference is, so this corridor has some residential, but very limited, and there's a residential property across the street. 
hence the reason I think restricting the hours. And since they've already said that they, per their operations plan, it's Sunday 10 to 6 and we're already getting them more hours. If the residential component wasn't there across the street, I, I would feel totally differently where I, I would be pushing this subject. Um, what are the, Mr. Leonard, what are the, that makes sense. Um, what are the bloom hours? Bloom is no hour restrictions. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe maybe the petitioner could weigh in. Um, thank you. Um, I think the nine to nine during the week and on Saturdays is, you know, perfectly acceptable. And, um, and the, you know, I mean, even 10 to seven on Sundays, um, you know, would also, you know, we would not be opposed to that. One thing I would like to kind of, um, I don't know how you can, I don't know how you can amend the language. Uh, but Obviously, we're only the SEU is only applicable to the provisioning center, but because this is an accessory provisioning center, and you know the cultivation facility may have you know different hours of operation, um, I wouldn't want there to be any confusion that the uh, traffic or anything that was going on in the parking lot or things happening within the cultivation facility are in some way in violation of this condition. So while the SEU is specific to, you know, the, the accessory provisioning center, I, I would feel more comfortable, I guess, if there was some language that, uh, that delineated between the two uses in terms of hours, if that were acceptable. So in my mind, it would, it would it be a friendly amendment to just spell out the hours of operation for the accessory provisioning center shall not exceed these. That is friendly. Okay. Any other discussion of what of the hours of operation proposed amendment, which again is nine to nine Monday through Saturday, 10 to seven on, no, yes, 10 to seven on Sunday and that it would apply, to be clear, only to the accessory retail component. All in favor of the amendment, please say yes. Yes. Yes, all right, any opposed? No, so that's everybody. Okay, so now we have the main gigantic motion that I initially read that has been amended twice one about physical improvements, including landscaping um, and restriping the parking lot, and the second one with ours. Any other discussion of this now amended motion? We need to include the bike thing, or can you handle that, Brett, in the next round in terms of um, it, it, just making sure that there's pavement, that there's not grass surrounding the bike parking? Do we need um, that to be part of this, or is that something that you all can just handle during the permit process. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable uh, just making sure that that happens. If, if okay. the petitioner, I just wanna be clear, that's not objectionable to the petitioner to make sure that that happens. Not at all. Okay, yeah, okay. Now I'm, we'll, we'll, we'll ensure that that happens. That and if it doesn't happen, it's my fault. <laughs> I'll come after you with my bike. <laughs> <laughs> and your muddy feet. For not muddy having bike, a muddy bike tires, technically, but yeah. you got to walk your bike through. Anyway, I need sleep, guys. Um, any other discussion? I think we're ready for a roll call vote, Mr. Leonard. Commissioner Briggs. Yes. Commissioner Mills. Yes. Commissioner Milstein. Okay. Uh, yes. Commissioner Gib Randall. Yes. Commissioner Ackerman. Yes. Commissioner Sove. Yes. Commissioner Abrams. Yes. Commissioner Hammerschmidt. Yes. It is approved. Very good. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. And, thank you. And if I may add to the uh, commissioners who are leaving this body, thank you for your service here, and we look forward to the next chapter. So, thank you all. Very good. Thank you. 
All right, now we are back to item number nine. Um, just a minute, that was a long motion on the other one. Uh, so this is 9A, unfinished business, back to our City Planning Commission fiscal year 2021-2022 work program. Mr. Leonard, you are the petitioner who is giving us your presentation. Can we have a can we have a, a, a body break for yes let's take uh let's take six minutes so we'll come back at nine okay that sounds great thank you yep thank you
to lead the discussion on work plan. Yes. Um, so, um, as part of your regular function, you um, the bylaws uh, um, direct us to work on a work program. Um, the goal is to obviously um, establish our priorities, and um, it you know helps me to understand what how I should be thinking about the resources uh, for myself and my team to help support your priorities as the planning commission. Um, I would say that while I am um, proud of the, the volume of accomplishment that has happened over the last couple of years, uh, I'll be the first to admit sometimes the work program um, falls down the bottom of the list as we're sort of um, wrestling with emerging issues or emerging directions, you name it. But nonetheless, I still think it's a valuable tool. Um, even if even if we don't get it all done, I think it still um, keeps me and the planning commission honest as to the things that resonate as important and of a high value for us as a community to be working on. And so, uh, when I first uh, presented the draft of this to you, it was coming, I think, at like eleven thirty after a particularly long uh, meeting, and we postponed it. Um, and at that time. Um, um, I must have been sort of channeling what was going to occur because the recommendation at that time was like, there's a lot of stuff in here and I need you guys to cut half of it out. Um, and uh, since that time, because um, because of some progress on a lot of fronts in, in those um, subsequent uh, months, as well as um, um, I just probably am blocking out um, some anxiety. Um, I, I'm not proposing that now. And in fact, I've added a couple of things to your proposed work plan. So um, generally, I've, I've shared this uh, with the packet and with you in advance. I'm just going to sort of go over um, what I'm proposing and um, then we can jump into it. Uh, the first, uh, the first uh, segment of the proposed work plan is what I'm calling projects. This would be both um, master plan type projects as well as other projects that, that aren't really ordinance related. And there's three projects on uh, proposed on here. One is the capital improvements plan. This is an annual function that the planning commission undertakes. Um, you've, uh, we recently had a work session about the sort of next phase of that work and how it's been restructured a little bit. Um, the fabulous Deb Gosselinois um, is a great a steward of that process for the city. Um, Master planning update, I've shifted this a little bit. Um, um, obviously, we went through, and some of the planning commissioners were involved in this process. Um, we had gone through an RFP process, uh, solicited consultant proposals to really tackle our master plan on a holistic level. That is, um, you know, absolutely um, starting, not starting over, but a comprehensive community visioning analysis of our master plan and, and really a comprehensive update of our master plan land use documents. Um, unfortunately, um, through a lot of hard work from commissioners, from other city staff, from some citizens that joined us on that journey, um, ultimately that was um, indefinitely postponed, a large part in, in part to the sort of uncertain financial situation of the city in this time of pandemic. And so, um, I am proposing that um, we, we as the planning commission shouldn't um, take that as sort of the determinant um, path forward. And in fact, we should find a different way to start updating our master plan. And so I'm envisioning that we put together our, uh, the master plan review subcommittee, which many of you are a member of, and we would um, probably start with a, a bit of dialogue about, um, I, I would envision, identifying some components or approaches or aspects of the master plan that we could perhaps bite off in chunks and then prioritize those and figure out which one we want to take on and start the work to update that aspect of our master plan. Then um, um, I've added a new project and I want to be clear that I don't envision this as um, part of a master plan, but um, I want, I'm proposing that we start a conversation with our community about single family zoning. Um, in this uh, in this time of um, uh, heightened attention to racial equity, uh, to sustainability, um, to um, poor um, poor choices of us as a government in the past, um, I 
I, I think this conversation is happening in our community. It's happening on a larger national scale about the legacy of single family zoning, um, how it evolved, the impacts that it has had to communities, um, particularly to, to separate um, socioeconomic um, populations in our communities. And, you know, I, I, I think, again, at, at its simplest, I think this conversation is happening on a national level. I think it's happening within our community. And I think it's a really hard conversation for us to have. Um, single family zoning does have a history of having adverse impacts to people of color. Um, it has an, an adverse impact on affordability at times, um, but it also has um, a lot of aspects of wealth creation in um, households and people in our community and elsewhere. Um, I, I think I, I'm proposing that we start this conversation um, without a goal in mind, without an objective in mind, just to um, be part of that trend where people are exploring this in their communities and uh, the legacies of these districts and how we should maybe start to think about them differently. Um, but again, I think I, th I think there's a lot of education as part of that conversation prior to us um, leaping towards any policy direction or consideration associated with it. Um, so I'll stop there for the sort of project oriented. And that last piece, um, I actually we've had some conversations about this. I would envision we actually appoint a subcommittee that might be comprised of both some planning commissioners, but it might be comprised of other community members as well to help us um, craft um, and, and have this conversation. So um, now I'll really stop and see if you have any thoughts on that before we maybe shift to the proposed ordinance work. To and be then, clear, I think we put it in, we decided that we were gonna have a, Public, public hearing, hearing. and okay. I think that I see a couple people on the line. So right, I don't so know if you want me, to make the presentation keep, and then we'll yeah. come back for discussion. Is my that okay? Apologies. Yep, my apologies, I forgot about that. Um, so let's shift into the next segment of the, of the work plan and that is um, very, very ordinance heavy um, updates to the UDC. This is obviously where we put our, um, this is where we take the policies that have already been established or desired and put them into code to ensure that we are getting the type of development in the city that we desire. Um, there's a lot of ordinance amendments that are going on and a lot of them are close to resolution, I believe. Um, the side ordinance um, has already been considered by city council once, it's coming back in December. Um, there might be some small tweaks to that based on a recent court decision, but largely I believe that that's um, in the final stages of resolution. Um, we are scheduled for November 16th to have the first reading of uh, electric vehicle parking ordinance and the solar height um, uh, exemption and solar accessory structure ordinances that you considered. Those are all um, currently scheduled for November 16th for first reading. That would put them in December for second reading. Outdoor lighting, um, I have inserted myself into that conversation a bit. There was, I think, I sense that there was some frustration about um, how we are regulating that from a zoning perspective, its relationship to non-conformities. I don't know that I will be able to solve that, but uh, both myself and our city attorney's office have been um, starting to just sort of, frankly, brainstorm that a little bit to see if there are some options to take some portions of the outdoor lighting regulations and advance their implementation in the city more quickly than through a zoning framework. Um, again, I just want to be clear. I don't know that we'll be able to get there. That's caused some delay before it progressed from your action to the city council. Nonetheless, I still anticipate that coming up in early 2021 for the city council. Um, unless something really substantially is different about it, in which case we might make the decision to bring it back to you. Um, that you passed a series of uh, UDC technical amendments. Um, I anticipate those, um, those were, um, um, those will probably go to the city council in December for first reading. Um, while they're largely ready to go, I think um, um, I um, appreciate the feedback for, that I've got from the administrator and my boss that um, maybe I was just putting too much on one agenda and it wouldn't hurt to let people go to bed once in a while. Um, then we also have on November 16th, the proposed floodplain overlay zoning district, which would be a second reading in uh, December. Um, you'll recall that we've made good progress, we believe, on proposed 
uh, plan project modifications. Uh, Alexis is working on some final tweaks to those. Um, so all of those, um, in addition uh, to two city city council directed amendments that are underway, one is recommendations on the, the C1A and C1AR zoning districts, and the other one is site plan review thresholds. Um, I anticipate making some progress on the C1A and C1AR, presenting some potential language for your consideration by the end of this calendar year. I don't think it'll be resolved. Um, by the end of the calendar year, but we'll provide an update to the city council of that progress at that time. Site plan review thresholds, um, I definitely don't anticipate <clears throat> presenting any language for ordinance amendments uh, to either you or the city council by the end of the calendar year, but rather working with the planning commission to adopt some direction to move forward in that regard in response to that city council direction. That is the review of site plan thresholds for small or modest projects to maybe facilitate them, make them a little easier. Uh, transit oriented development um, has started and then stopped. Um, we were working on that. The city council uh, earlier this year had considered a resolution to prioritize that. It was tabled. Um, based on that, um, frankly, I just made sort of the resource decision that I didn't want to put a lot of time into that. Um, if there didn't seem to be widespread support for it. Um, I think that there's probably, um, uh, I think that that ordinance is going to be, um, uh, I think it's gonna be reconsidered, um, the um, appropriateness to take that up as a priority given how it relates to so many of the city's climate change goals, um, uh, particularly. And then um, parking standards is something that I keep presenting to you and I think it's time that I actually do it for you. And a new one is accessory buildings and structures. Um, accessory buildings and structures, I think our ordinance is currently um, quite convoluted in how they are regulated. And I would you have to go to actually several different places in our ordinance to understand the regulations for things like garages or flagpoles or um, pools or, um, play structures, you name it. And um, I think that our ordinance should not only be a, a more clear from, uh, frankly, selfishly, a way for us to be able to efficiently administer it, but it should be a lot more easy and clear for the public to understand what they can and they cannot do on their properties. And right now it's a little common. Um, so um, those are all of my proposed uh, work plan items. Um, I'm framing this actually as potentially a two-year work plan, actually. Um, um, but uh, I'm sort of thinking it, I, I was starting to think about it a little bit like the capital improvements plan where maybe every other year we sort of really throw it out the window and just open brainstorm, but then maybe we sort of commit to these um, over a multi-year period to really try and make some progress on them. So with that, um, maybe we can shift to, okay. unless you have any questions prior to that. Thank you very much. I have comments, which are all complimentary, but I'll uh, wait after, until after public hearing. Um, this is an opportunity for persons to speak for up to three minutes about the proposed work plan. Public comment may be made by calling 877-853-5247 and then entering meeting ID 986-8779-4537. City staff will select callers that have digitally raised their hand. You do that by pressing star nine. And Mr. Leonard will call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Um, you'll get an automated announcement that you are allowed to speak. You might still have to unmute your phone. Um, but when you do that, please move to a quiet area and mute any other background noise so that we can hear you clearly. And please do state your name and address at the beginning of your comments. Again, folks on the line, if you would like to provide a public comment about the work plan, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. I don't see any hands. If people come in urgently, well, I'll keep my eyes on that. But um, do any planning commissioners want to, oh, I need to read the motion, sorry. Let me read the motion and then we can discuss it. Um, the motion is the Ann Arbor City Planning Commission hereby adopts the City Planning Commission fiscal year 2021-2022 work plan. 
moved by Commissioner Sauvé, seconded by Commissioner Milstein. Now we can discuss it. Commissioner Hammerschmidt and then Commissioner Milstein. I really like the idea of doing like a two year work plan. I'm curious, I probably can assume that I know the answer. Would you think then like at a year we would sort of review progress and like shift around a little bit if necessary. And then every two years to sort of be like a big overhaul. Yeah. Um, cool. Or we could, we could do it on a more frequent basis. Um, you know, I think part of it is just, um, and again, I, I'll, I'll take uh, some, I'll, I'll take some responsibility for this too, but I think um, part of me is just kind of always looking for a better system and um, um, maybe sort of thinking about it in a longer term chunk. Like some of these, um, they'll be long dialogues. And I think at times, um, I don't think it's bad to just sort of think now that, you know, talking about something like parking requirements might take us more than a year. And so just sort of mentally thinking about it in that scale might be helpful, but absolutely. But I, I would just say it doesn't have to be a year. It's at any point you could revisit this, but I think this is an effective way that we can communicate to the public to elected officials, to other uh, boards and commissions, our priorities out of the body. I like it. Um, and I really like the starting a, a conversation, um, community learning opportunity on single family zoning. I think that's a great addition. So yeah, no questions, really just complimentary. Ambitious. <laughs> Commissioner or Milstein and then Commissioner Sauvé. Thank you. Um, so I love the single family um, discussion. I think it's time that we as a community have that and I'm volunteering to serve on that subcommittee. I'll just step up for it right now. Um, the accessory dwelling um, is a common, go ahead. So accessory building. Sorry, accessory building. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> The accessory building question, especially from the real estate community, that comes up all the time. And you hit control F in the UDC and it, you keep going through it and none of it is, it's very confusing. So I'm all for that as well. Um, and then I'm coming back to T1. Um, my hope is that we are gonna see it very soon. So I think we should keep it at the forefront um, and maybe start work on that. Otherwise, great plan, and I do like the idea of having it a two-year plan. Thank you. Commissioner Sobe. Yeah, I really like two years. I like the big idea projects. The one thing in terms of like little projects, uh, the 2021 work, the page three, it has, um, Planning Commission operations, timing schedules of petitions, staff reports, overall process. I think we've gotten a lot with notifications for the commissioner proposed business stuff. I don't know when we address it, if it is just each year we talk about kind of the little things we also want to tick off, but we, we do consistently get, you know, comments about what the postcards are. And I know we took a look at that, but notices and things. So just kind of bringing it up again is with the floodplain one, you know, we wouldn't visit it. So it feels small. I don't know how small it really is, but I like the two year broad, but maybe is there anything about what the, the smaller little pieces we might plug in as kind of the one year bits, especially since we have so much that looks like it's going to unload really soon. So I just kind of want to raise the kind of page three with the commissioner business as well in the kind of smaller and more specific pieces and how we approach that. I mean, my, my initial reaction to that would be if, if um, I would sort of like it elevated, you know, maybe that is another project. We might recognize that maybe it doesn't feel as big as some of the other projects, but um, part of the reason of putting that there is I want to, I want to acknowledge, I mean, I think some of these things drive the priorities that are already there to an extent, but I want to be, um, I, I want to be faithful to these thoughts and not lose sight of them. And and I think your observation is great. If you know we've brought it up a couple of times, if if that's an aspiration, I would say let's add it to the plan, and we just got to figure out a way to uh, incorporate that. And hopefully, at the end of that two year period, we've answered it. Okay. Yeah, and kind of what I'm raising is 
maybe it doesn't like pop up right now, but as things clear, if we have like a checkpoint at one year or every six months at a working session, we just kind of look and say, all right, how much progress have we gone? Are there kind of little things we can add? Because uh, we also don't know what kind of council we're going to have and what kind of tasks they are going to allot us that might be different, heavier or lighter than the previous council. So I'm not sure how we, how we gauge plugging those things in and holding space for both of them. So I just kind of bring it up as a talking point. Commissioner Abrams. I have a question that's just a little bit about, um, I guess staffing is what I'd call it, even though we're not staff. Um, because uh, like I'm very, very uh, excited and in support of the single family zoning community conversation and project. I also wish I could be on that subcommittee, but I think I'm probably committed out. But I also remember that when we did talk about um, committees, it seemed like we were digging deep to, to staff the, to like populate the committees. And I'm, my impression now is that we're going to be one more, at least one more commissioner short. I just wondered, is there any update about new commissioners joining the body in, in the near future? Yeah. I, um, I, my understanding is that the mayor has two uh, potential candidates, citizen reps that he's going to be uh, nominating. Um, uh, and then um, I would anticipate once the new council um, is seated, the 16th is their first meeting, the November 16th. But I would anticipate probably within the first um, uh, uh, Commissioner Br uh, Briggs or Ackerman might know this better, but I'm guessing within the first two months, um, there will probably be some progress on the council appointments to the various boards and commissions. So I would, I am thinking that um, there might be a brief period where um, our our numbers are lower, but I don't think it's going to be long till we're back to a full uh, full commission. Okay, great. Um, and then I just had a question about. So there, the, there's the potential future projects, which have the kind of orange pattern header, and then there's the proposed commissioner business. And those, do we understand this to be, have any hierarchy of prioritization or importance? And would it be helpful at all to pull some of those out to be, like, I guess as Commissioner Sove just did, like identify the ones that we would want to be kind of in the waiting room if time allowed? Yeah, just um, no, uh, there's no, um, there's no particular prioritization from my lens. I will just tell you um, potential future projects have been those, those tend to be projects that have been carried forward on quite a few work, work programs. Um, and so I've been somewhat reluctant to just say, yeah, I don't think they really care about that much anymore. And then the commissioner of business is just, um again you this is more recent um oftentimes in the course of a meeting um th this is all commissioner proposed business items and um i take those seriously um i can't as you know i can't always um jump into a long process on each of those but my goal is to at a minimum memorialize them to make sure that well is like if we take on transit zoning, that might hit a lot of those goals on some level. Um, but on the flip side, um, yeah, you might decide that yellow table, let's just scratch it and start over. And a long way of saying, I don't see them as prior to di priority, uh, different, different priorities. They, they've just come to this document as sort of a potential future laundry list and they came from two different sources. And do you, <clears throat> excuse me, do you, would it be helpful to you for us to provide any clarification about those two lists or are you okay having them as they are? Um, they don't, um, I don't care that they're there. Um, I think that, but my, my message to you is I'm not, I'll, I'll probably not be spending a lot of time trying to advance those. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'm just sort of presenting them to you as, I heard you in some cases, or I heard previous commissions in some cases, but for now, these are the places where I'm going to try to put my energies to advance ordinance or policy change. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Briggs. Yeah, um, regarding the city council 
um, sort of appointment. My understanding is those commission appointments usually happen in early by early December. So I think that might be the likely time frame when um, a new appointment would come from city council. Um, and then one thing in with regards to that, in terms of, I agree, there's kind of been a, seems like it's been challenging. I don't, I don't think the ZBA position is, is there anybody serving on the ZBA right now from planning commission? No, the ZBA is full, but there's no planning commission uh, right. and ZBA appointment. Exactly. So that was like, that was one of the open ones. Um, uh, council recently um, put together a, a new committee or group, the center of the city task force, or not a task force, but anyway, but it has a position, it has a seat for a representative from parks commission as well as from planning commission. And so um, it might be useful for planning commission at some point if, if that is a challenging seat to fill to provide, I would think maybe provide some feedback on that. Um, and then just to the work plan, um, I think it, I think it um, sounds great. I think there's going to be a lot of interest in sort of development issues. I, um, it's good to see sort of figure out what sort of master parts of the master plan process can move forward. Um, maybe the, the visioning process in terms of community values and vision might be one piece. I know also um, one of the debates that has happened this last year around TOD was the, the complaint of when we still thought the master plan process was going to begin was, well, how could you possibly start um, thinking about a transit oriented um, development district before you started the master plan update? Um, and so, it, you know, we've talked about the fact that it, that that piece is actually embedded. This is master planning process and, and it really just starting from nowhere. It's, it's actually been a part of our pre-existing documents and that was part of the, supposed to be part of the master plan update anyway was to sort of identify where some of those um, where there's a lot of history on certain certain ideas and so um, especially on something like um, TOD it might be um, really useful to have some of that um, documented as to you know how many different layers of our plan that that's that that's been in already and you know some other guiding principles that um some other pieces as well okay uh with regard to single family zoning i think that is also something that's been particularly controversial for the community so it's great to have that conversation being brought up i think there's going to be a lot of concern from the community and skepticism from certain parts of the community that this isn't just educational, it's leading somewhere. And so I think having, um, addressing that concern up front will be important um, in terms of, and thinking through exactly what does this process look like in terms of, obviously I think just we need, there are a lot of misconceptions around um, why those processes have happened in other communities, what, you know, what sort of outcomes they've led to, what the history of Ann Arbor actually looks like, what the implications have been in our own community. So I think it's great that we're having those conversations and actually think that right now is probably um, one of the, um, there may be some benefits to, to COVID and doing it now because any of those, those conversations happened sooner rather than later, they would automatically be on a be presentations that are online that could be recorded, that could be then saved and um, people might be able to watch them later if there's another subsequent conversation about, you know, okay, well, maybe this, you know, maybe there are some ordinance changes that we want to pursue, but then we would have this sort of repository of um, educational um, pieces that, that are already existing around it. So I think that might be great. Um, Kit McCullough, is somebody that might be, if not somebody for the working group, um, I don't want to volunteer her because <laughs> that would be, uh, <laughs> she would be surprised, but I know she might be a good person, at least for a presentation. She um, came to a fifth old west uh, side meeting at one point and gave a, a really compelling sort of um, uh, presentation on it. So I would, I can imagine she be, might be a good speaker, but I can imagine she also has a interest at a level that she might be interested in being a part of the working group. She's at the University of Michigan School of Art and of Architecture and Urban Planning. So um, comes with a lot of credentials as well. So, my thoughts. 
I, if, if I could just, I, I really appreciate the, the, the feedback on, on this idea. I, th I think that I, I, I hear and I embrace what you're talking about being really, I, I think that this conversation is gonna be really important to sort of establish what our goals are and how we envision it to happen. Um, I think separating it from any policy development is gonna be really helpful to that goal. But at the same time, I think I, 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 wanna, I, wanna, be, I wanna be honest that like part of the reason to have the conversation is that in the future, we may wanna consider those policy goals. But I, but I really think that there is a value to just explore the issue first, um, just learn about it. And, um, and I, I totally agree. I think that there's, I think there's going to be a natural tendency for people to say, then what? And I think that it's going to take some discipline on how we structure that um, to make sure that we're successful and um, pro just for providing a safe space, I think, to have the conversation without jumping to that conclusion. Commissioner Ackerman. Thank you. Um, uh, just a quick comment on when you're going to get new colleagues. Also, um, those two potential appointments are on the city council agenda for next week. So you'll just by way of process, it takes two meetings. So you'll probably get all your new colleagues in December. Um, and then uh, with respect to the sequencing of a community conversation and public education regarding single family zoning and its interaction with ADU policy. I think that it might be beneficial to sequence with ADUs coming first and that we have tangible policy recommendations that that can happen and are the product of a community conversation um, and then engage in the single family, um, the broader single family uh, dialogue only in that um, I think one of the common refrains that I've heard during my tenure about ADUs is that it's an upzoning of single family zoning. And so I think if you have those two conversations at the same time, people connect those dots, whether, you know, it's, it's appropriate or not. Um, and it may be more beneficial to, to just, you know, try to get the ADU policies done and then turn your attention to the zoning districts as a whole. To be clear, as a point of clarification, I understand that ADUs is not currently on our on our work plan anywhere, right? Correct. But this is something where this, if I'm remembering all of this right, we did some work in the past on ADUs, and it went to city council in 2018. And nothing happened. And it failed there. It, right. Nothing happened. It was voted down. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so it could be dusting that off. I, are you suggesting that we add Commissioner Ackerman ADUs back to our list, or because that's not currently on our our work plan? Um, you know, I'm a I'm a washed up has been. I don't know. You you all can can dictate your own uh, agenda, but I think it. I think it's vitally important for our community that ADUs be further liberalized and made more um, realistic because currently they're not. Commissioner Briggs. If I recall correctly, council didn't necessarily entirely um, kill it. They, there was a suggestion that more community engagement was needed. Um, so that's. And then it was voted down. Was it actually physical? Was it actually voted down? Yeah, it was defeated. I thought, okay, I guess I, I missed that meeting. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Abrams. I would support adding that to the work plan. So I, if, I, I guess I wanna just make sure I understand. Um, the So the history of that was council had directed planning commission to look at amendments to the accessory dwelling unit ordinance to maybe further their realization in the city. You went through that process, made recommendations. Ultimately, those were not enacted by the council. Um, I just wanna get a sense, would you like to sort of start a broader conversation or would your thought be, let's restart those, 
that package that was previously considered. Commissioner Gibrandel. I kind of feel like starting the broader conversation because that's like one of the ways that we may end up getting to, but it feels like it's kind of like a, uh, like a solution before you have the conversation in the first place. Um, that, that when we have that conversation, it might lead to, to, to different strategies or not or whatever. Um, and, that, and that's one um, possibility of them. But I, I don't know, I guess that's just how I feel is sort of start big and then and then get more defined in terms of strategies based on that if if it goes in that direction. I don't know if others have thoughts. That's my kind of initial reaction on that. Just the the thought that I have that but but maybe I should let the folks who won't be with us next time weigh in on this uh, is that that makes it really tricky then. <laughs> what I heard Commissioner Ackerman saying is that if you if you go into the conversation about single family zoning saying like, we, if, given what Commissioner Briggs said, we have no, there's not necessarily a policy in mind, but there is a policy that we're looking about it. Like that's where sequences, that sequencing these things might make sense. But if what, what Commissioner Abrams, you were just talking about is, pulling out what we have and saying we like looking at it potentially in the next month and saying we still stand by this like we put all this work into this two years ago and we still stand by it like i don't know that that is so much work as just us sending it back <laughs> to council but um commissioner ackerman weigh in tell me where that's wrong so no no not where you're wrong at all just to, to build on that i, I think you know, with the ADUs policy we put forward in 2018, you know, we knew these were good ideas in 2017, and then we refined them over the course of 2018 and put them before city council, which means these are ideas we knew were good for the last three years. And if we broaden it to the to a wider conversation and then focus back in, we're going to wait another two years. So that's delaying five years, an idea we knew was a good one three years ago. I will say, though, there will be, fifth, by the time by the time you all read this legislation again, there will have been 50% turnover on the planning commission. So it's likely things might get iterated upon or improved upon um, with a new set of eyes, but I, I think I think they were pretty good. I think we worked really hard on them and they move the community forward in making ADUs more realistic. Commissioner Abrams. Uh, that, is, that is what I was, um, intending, I realize I spoke very succinctly, but that, that's, that's what I was intending. Um, I also think we have like two years of data, which is, which will, which that kind of demonstrates the um, inefficacy, like the way in which the current ordinance doesn't work, right? It isn't producing the intended effect. And so, um, yeah, I think it would be worth revisiting that uh, with a different council too. And that has to come from us. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Leonard, right? Like, I mean, council can tell us to do it or we can send it, but they can't come up with a new zoning ordinance all themselves. Like that's how Michigan zoning law works. Yeah, when specifically our, our code says that city council can't enact land use legislation without asking for your, the planning commission's opinion on it. But also there's nothing stopping us from sending something unsolicited other than like wasting time. So. Correct. Okay, Commissioner Milstein. Um, I think it'd be really important, and I'm looking at Commissioner Briggs right now, more so than anybody else. I think it'd be really important to get some feedback from our new council when they um, are uh, sworn into office about what's a priority for them um, so that we don't spin our wheels and work on something that is not a priority. So I, I don't know how we can have that conversation. Um, I think at one point, you know, I think it's been a, a really long time since we've had a joint session. And I know joint sessions today are not quite, you know, when you have that many people on Zoom, they're not quite as productive. But I think it'd be really great. And I'm not saying that it needs to be anything formal. I don't think we need a, a council to pass a resolution. But it'd be really great to get a, all right, here's our work plan. What do you want us to work on first? You know, what's a priority for our council? 
Um, I know we have some say in, in it, but I think at the end of the day, it ends up on their table. So it'd be great to get feedback from council about our work plan. Commissioner Briggs. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a great idea in terms of a, a joint working session sooner rather than later, I can imagine. Um, I think that there is a lot of interest um, in different um, different issues, um, uh, including accessory, accessory dwelling units. Um, and uh, thinking about that, having that, that joint discussion um, might be useful, is challenging to do over, do over Zoom. Um, so I suspect that there will be um, a fair amount of different recommendations kind of um, coming forward to a request coming forward to planning commission um, in the next not too long <laughs> but um, you know I think that one piece that um, is really important to just remember is even though kind of amongst this body it feels like these conversations have happened a lot um, when you're revisiting a conversation that happened a couple of years ago or three years ago and there's new people in the community sometimes you have to you have to go a little bit slower and, and bring back in that that community engagement and bring um, have that conversation about you know kind of what Commissioner Abrams was saying in terms of okay you know we, we passed this you know, what happened with our previous um, AD ordinance and, and what are we really, what were our goals? Why did we not, you know, what wasn't realized, you know, is that something that we still stand behind and, and allow the community to kind of have that conversation too, because I, I think there's a lot of concerns. Um, the primary concerns that I have heard is that, um, from the community is that some of these conversations get pushed, seem to get pushed through pretty quickly. Um, but I think part of it is, because you know, folks aren't, aren't aren't always necessarily aware of uh, previous conversations that have happened. But um, yeah, I think they'll be. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. Mr. Leonard. Well, I, um, I I guess I would I would urge the planning commission um, to think about your your priorities. Yes, city council can um, direct and and, and suggest. Um, but, um, I, like, I guess that my initial thought is think about, think about accessory dwelling units. And if you want to add it to your work plan, is it, do you think it's important for us? Um, I, th I think that whatever work plan, whether it gets adopted tonight or it gets adopted at some future date, that, that will be communicated to the city council. So that is an opportunity for you to share with the city council, how you see, um, priorities, should be should be approached and what activities we should be resourcing to that end and i would say that if um as it relates specifically to accessory dwelling units um rather um i think that there's going to be a lot that there's always a lot of demand on you there's always a lot of demand on city council and i by no means would i would um uh diminish the value of a joint session but um like something like that i would say that I mean, if, if you think it's a priority, that's probably a pretty quick thing for us to do because we have done some work on it. Um, and we, we, I don't think it has to be one or the other. We could use that as a template. Um, you know, for example, we could dedicate a working session to it and we could uh, advertise that widely, um, you know, go beyond our normal notice requirements, try to get it out on social media and, and public notice and, and more gov deliveries and neighborhood associations. And we could, um, we could um, spend some time just talking about the previous direction that led us to craft those recommendations. We could we could put together some data, um, and I would say something like that. While not expansive, it is opening up a conversation with the community about something that was previously done and why it was done. And then from that, you as the planning commission or any feedback you've received at that point from city council can take all of that in to decide how you wanna to respond to that. Do you feel like it's time to go forward as largely it is or um, to Commissioner Gibrandle's point, maybe there's new factors that warrant a wider conversation. So um, I would say unlike some other things on this work plan, actually, we have the benefit that we've been through it 
Um, we've got a um, sort of like the classic, you know, is it better to sort of brainstorm and draft something or you put something out there to get a re solicit a reaction and a conversation about what it says. So, um, so my recommendation would be if you feel that this is worthwhile, particularly as Commissioner Ackerman is saying that you, you believe that it has some value in timing or association with or in a chronology with other work plan items, I would suggest we just put it on our, our plan and we try to accomplish that um, period. I'll chime in that it seems to me, based on the conversation, that it, there's already a lot of sunk time in it and that dusting it off, I honestly don't, I mean, things have not changed all that much. I welcome looking at it again, especially with the new commissioners that we have and potentially like, I don't really want to wait too, too long to get the next, you know, but by the time we actually get around to this, we'll even have more new commissioners on. Um, I, I'm swayed by the idea that we don't really want to start the conversation about single family homes, single family neighborhoods um, with this hanging out there. Um, and I think that that conversation will take longer than we think it will. In, and I think that's important. And so I would, I think that that makes sense to add. I would support adding it. Commissioner Ackerman, before we lose you, and, or Commissioner Briggs, what else is like that? Is there anything else that you can think of, which we spent some time on, but that didn't make it from the, like? Just TOD. Just TOD, okay. I was gonna say, it's been a while. I feel like there were elements of like, D1, D2 that, that happened too as well, but it, I so can't remember, and I think that it, it's like moved on. Like <laughs> the changes that we made to premiums like have subsequently moved on. <laughs> yeah, so. this past, you know, uh, the only other like one out there was uh, updates to the traffic calming program, um, but that's a different body. That's Transportation Commission. Okay. Yeah. Commissioner Gib Randall. What about um, the whole solar in your yard business? It, it seems to me that that's something that um, is another thing that we sunk a bunch of time into and that given our community priorities, I don't know, I'm seeing Brett waving his hands all over the place. I'll stop. <laughs> well, I, I, I see that as linked to accessory structures, but go for it. Agreed. Okay. I think that's the opportunity when you pull up kind of what is allowed. Mm -hmm. In some ways, I see this, you guys, uh, it's like zoroing all of these different elements. Like we're, zor like we're making clearer what our site plan requirements are. We're making okay. clearer what is a, access, a, like accessory structures, what, where they're allowed to see where it doesn't make sense. What? I want to I excise that as a verb from our vocabulary. Zoroing? No, no Zoro. No Zoro. Getting, okay. Getting triggered. <laughs> Sorry. Is that, but is that, is that, you didn't mention that as your intention, but do you see that as part of that work element? Well, you know, I, I will say that the, the UDC, I think, has, um, has, is, was a great leap forward. Um, you know, just as a reminder, um, we went from 10 chapters to one chapter. Um, we did a lot of consolidation, but I, I will also say that we consolidated a lot of ordinances that were still based in their core on a mid 1960s origination. And so, um, you know, the, we as a city made that decision that that was the direction we were going to go in. And I think um, there are those that have been around longer than I am that have that always envisioned that there was a couple sort of large scale pictures that were important to do. One was um, to get the UDC done. Then it might have been to do a master plan. And then it might be now that the UDC is amendable, how do we really drastically change it to get the things that we want? And, um, I, you know, again, the UDC is, is much better, but things like accessory buildings, um, us adding in 
um, whether it's solar structures and personal solar structures or ADUs. Um, we are, a lot of what we're doing is shoehorning, thing, shoehorning things that we um, desire now into a framework that it sometimes wasn't set up for that. And so that's where you end up with three different places in the ordinance to figure out if I build a garage, where does it have to be and how tall can it be and it, what is it exempt from? And so, um, so um, I, I won't use that as a verb, but I think part of it is um, the next phase. And I think at, at sometimes it's further organization and consolidation. And sometimes I think it's um, moving on from how we approach something in the past to how we should approach something in the future. Commissioner Briggs. You asked if there were any other things that have been brought up from the past, I can't think of anything um, in terms of how this discussion has gone in terms of, you know, your suggestion of, you know, bringing it back to the work plan and I, and others as well. I think that that's, I think that makes sense. I think there's going to be a lot of, um, you know, I'm, I'm only comfortable speaking for myself and not for, for not for an incoming council body. Um, and so obviously all the things that I'm excited about and um, parking being one of them that ties to so many different things, um, I think are really important. But uh, I think, I think it's fair to say that you're, you're going to have a, a city council that is very receptive to um, hearing what planning commission thinks are priorities for our community. Um, and so, um, you know, that I, I'm only cautioning that sometimes it feels like we've had these conversations a lot and we have, but we've had this conversation and people, you know, people don't, aren't always aware that, you know, despite the fact that these are publicly noticed, publicly noticed, they're just not really aware that the conversations are happening. So as Mr. Leonard suggested in terms of, you know, broadcasting something a little bit broader around a working session, I think that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, if, if something like ADUs is, is coming up again, that, that gives the community an opportunity to, to be a part of that conversation again um, and, and to understand where it's coming from. So, but I think that there's going to be a lot of, a lot of interest to, to think about where Ann Arbor should be heading next. I'll just add in that I think um, one of the things that Commissioner Abrams brought up before is about our capacity. And with the new staff or with the new planning commissioners, we'll have to revisit our committee appointments. I don't have that table right in front of me, but I think what one of the committees that we like staffed up to get ready to do something with was effectively the affordability committee. And in my mind, there's a number of things that are our work plan that don't necessarily have that in the title, but that link so much to that, right? So if we do undertake the single family units, there's, there's clearly a link to that. So much of what you're finding in um, the site plan review threshold for those small and medium projects really is about like how expensive there are there are elements within the site plan that makes it make those projects expensive but on those calls so for those who aren't on ORC to know like um there's this committee that is being pulled together this work group effectively that um that council asked um staff to man but they've been doing interviews with each of those committee members before pulling them together and so some of us on the ORC have been listening in and like things about big projects and the affordability of big projects are also coming up so I think that all of this stuff is linked um, the elements about su sustainability like can you afford to do some of the elements of sustainability like these things are all coming together so I think that actually everything Brett I want to you know this is the compliment like everything that you've laid out are the things it's getting to the heart actually of the things that we think are really important and continuing and the master plan conversation that you have I'm positive that you're going to find things on park that will inform the parking discussion like this has been in so many of the past master plans right like it it, it needs a conversation but just like TOD is justified in all of the many, many documents that are our master plan, going back and like dusting those off and seeing what's still relevant and what's not, I think is gonna be super helpful for that. So 
I'm really excited about this. I like the idea of it being a two-year work plan. I think that there, we have to recognize that right now the we have in progress the fiscal year 2020 city council directed amendments. But I think we know that, well, I, I expect that there are going to be ordinance changes that come out of some of those things that we're going to want to add to our work plan to leapfrog things that, that we're not anticipating right now. So I want to make sure that you are under, like that's your intention too. And that as Erica just said, like there's probably going to be things that come from fiscal year 2021 city council directives that are coming too. Is that I, To be clear, I don't, I think that, you know, and we have done this, we've had to adapt and we've had to juggle and we've had to shift priorities and focus and we'll have to continue to do that. Um, I will say though, I think that I am interested to see um, as we make more progress and actually set more of your priorities as a planning commission, um, I think that there's a lot of alignment with the items that city council is concerned about as, as well. And um, I, I fear, I speculate at times those directives happen because there's a perception that nothing's happening on those fronts to advance those ideas as quickly as desired. And so um, whether they're, whether we get a resolution saying do this or you choose to do that, the benefit to the community is the same. Yeah. Well, I'm, I think that the in progress stuff is a testament and the things that are like in progress but soon to be finished is a testament to like how much you have helped move us. So thank you and your entire team. Um, if you, you weren't watching the thumbs up that we're also here. Um, it sounds to me like from our conversation before Commissioner Abrams had suggested an amendment. Do you want a formal amendment to add in the, um, the accessory dwelling units discussion? That was the one that I picked up on. And then there was a quasi amendment that Commissioner Sauvey included on the process, but we didn't really discuss that one much. So yeah, well, I was I was about to sort of uh, reflect back what I was hearing. Um, I was hearing to add um, from the proposed commissioner business list the um, uh, timing scheduling of petition staff report overall process. I, I envision that a conversation about our citizen participation postcards, the notification um, timing of how all of that happens leading up to it landing on your agenda item for discussion. Um, uh, so I would, I was hearing to add that as a project um, to our proposed work plan. And then I am also hearing, I was also hearing let's add accessory dwelling units. Um, I'm actually proposing that we add that as an ordinance. Um, however, as described, I think we'll, we will start that with a broader conversation about what are the goals that we are seeking to achieve and um, use it more as a template as to, um, well, we'll use it as parallel to, here's what was considered in the past towards these goals, have that conversation to validate if that still resonates with the community. And then we can decide, do we need to go back and make adjustments or can we start, um, dusting it off in its largely the same form and moving forward. And I am hearing that it's important that that particular ordinance happens before we undertake that project of conversation about zoning. Sounds good to me. So then, yeah, if, if you're comfortable and that those changes resonate with, I think Lisa moved and Alex seconded, um, I would um, love to get it adopted so we can share it with the public and other boards and commissions and the council and get to work on it. Any dis more discussion? You can have a roll call vote if you need it. Of the proposal as, okay as we just talked about being amended. Please say yes, raise, or raise your hand. Yes. yes, any opposed? I saw Alex's hand now. So 
That was before I said a post. So that's for the record, all of us are in agreement. Um, it carries. And, and so thank you. This is a lot. I know, you know, it's a lot of work for staff. It's a lot of work for the planning commission too. I, I appreciate and um, um, I look forward to accomplishing as much of it as we can. Great. The last item, well, the second to last item is audience participation. It's an opportunity, the final opportunity for persons to speak for up to three minutes about any item of interest. Public comment can be made by calling 877-853-5247. And our meeting ID is 986-8779-4536. Mr. Leonard will call on you when you raise your hand. You do that by pressing star nine. And do move to a quiet area. Introduce yourself with your name and address. There is a caller on the line if you'd like to speak. Star nine is how you can signal that. They're from Denver. That's fine. All right. Seeing none. Seeing none. Item 12, commission proposed business. Anyone want to propose something? You kind of just had your opportunity. For the next work plan. For the next work plan. Please. All right. Item 12, Please. adjournment. Please. <laughs> Moved by Commissioner Milstein, seconded by Commissioner Sauvet. All in favor of adjourning, say yes. 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 All right. All opposed. None opposed. Thank you all. One abstention. Have a great night. Thank you very much, Commissioner Ackerman and Commissioner.